This is Cybert signing into Kane's Wrath on the map Tears of Sorrow for the lower bracket semi final. A best of seven between this yellow GDI player in the top left hand corner. This is Drive. And the red marked of Kane player in the bottom right side. This is is Shock Trepid. They have both advanced through several rounds of incredibly difficult opponents, and look at this. Shock Trepid learned his lesson. He knows that there are two spikes on this map. I guess spoilers, if you have not seen some of the other videos in this tournament series, well, to be honest, even if you know who wins, there are some phenomenal games played in this, particularly the upper bracket quarterfinals and the lower brackets round five and six are genuinely worth watching, even if you know who wins. There are some great series and some great individual games in those videos. And since we're talking about that, big, big thanks to Rotter Milan for donating the $1,000 prize pool for this event. That's just cash out of his own pocket. Just a random community member, so to speak, deciding I'm going to get involved. I'm going to throw $1,000 of my own money towards this event, towards this tournament. And Bike Rush stepping back from the competitive play and instead hosting and organizing only casting the games as well live broadcasting that and then of course you got the vods on his channel and on green zero's channel as well green zero playing in the event up to a certain point and then losing and unfortunately well unfortunately losing and transitioning into just casting i'm sure he would have loved to be there until the end and that's actually why you see, uh, always place a, rough, a rifle inside of your APC. So then when the APC gets EMP'd, the rifle keeps on shooting. Tears of Sorrow. We saw in the upper bracket final, this map get played very differently than what we are seeing right now. Pit bulls and attack bikes from these two players. Second War Factory right out of the gate for Shock Trepid. So he goes down to the low ground and then he says, I want to go aggressive. I want to get some more units out onto the field. Meanwhile, Drive gets the refinery, places it down immediately there. And Shock Trepid looking better in this game one than his game one against Phoenix. Although, of course, he did end up beating Phoenix in that series. And now Attack Bike's going to be moving up to the high ground. Watchtower is ready and waiting. Bike's going to be able to get a couple of shots against that rear armor on the Harvester as well, doing that bonus damage to the Harvester. One bike dies on exit. Shock Trepid, a Tib Wars player for a number of years, coming over to Kane's Wrath only occasionally, but in the last couple of years, pretty consistently, two pit bulls get grabbed. Drive going to be trying to trade out, but the trades aren't going to be as favorable as they would be with those two pit bulls online the whole time. He will still clean up basically every single bike as they try to escape back to their homeland. And now Shock Trepid has some pressure to deal with of his own. The pit bulls shouldn't be able to get much done. They don't head up the hill. Instead, they come back around into the middle of the map and head down south. Second War Factory up and running. No command post, it looks like, just yet from Drive, probably on the way, and no operation center yet from Shock Trepid. Shock Trepid having a phenomenal run in this tournament, but this is where he comes down to basically the final four. I mean, at this stage in the tournament, there's Futurama and Master Leaf up there in the upper bracket, which, you know, if you haven't seen the upper bracket final, I'm about to spoil it for you. Master Leaf dropping down to the lower bracket final. So this is where things get. They go from difficult to nearly impossible for Shock Trepid. I have not seen him win consistent games, whole series against Drive, Master Leaf, and Futurama. 
Shock Trumpet is undoubtedly a good player, and this is where his wins against Futurama or against uh, Phoenix in the lower bracket and leading into this series against Drive. This is where he has had maybe the best tournament run of his life against these players. But this is where it really, really becomes real. Drive has got seven games potentially here to knock down Shock Trepid, and Shock Trepid has to go the distance against Drive and then against Master Leaf and then against Futurama, and he has never had that kind of a tournament performance yet. Obelisk is here, Avatar as well. Scorpion's going to be able to push away these Preds, and two of those Scorpions dying, unfortunately, because of a movement bug. But Hammerheads find a power plant, knock it down, and that is going to be lights out for a couple of moments here, reinvigorating the front line of Drive. He's gonna try and find another angle into the natural expansion. He's gonna try and shut down that Redeemer Engineering Facility. It's gonna be a power plant to try and body block. It's offline, it's going down. Drive is gonna get the kill. The cancel comes in and that's a Redeemer that almost comes out but doesn't ever materialize and Drive shuts down the late game play of Shock Trepid, but this battle is not over. Avatars marching to the front line. The Hammerheads are almost unmatched in their utility, but the Stealth Tanks show up just in time for Shock Trepid. Avatars popping those Pred Tanks one by one, but the front line has evaporated for Shock Trepid. All he's got left is these Avatars. They're finding a couple of extra kills. Hammerhead splitting off to the south side and Drive is looking for a weaker front ace, an easier opening into the base of Shock Trepid. He will find it here in the south. Avatar's slow to respond. Obelisk not in the right position. And so this refinery will have to bear the brunt of the attack. But Drive behind this is going to be looking for the third base. He is going to be looking for that follow-up. He can choke out Shock Trepid, but he needs something behind the scenes to keep his eco rolling. Shock Trepid has been banking a decent amount of cash up to this point, and now he finds Harvesters unprotected and unawares. The Hammerheads will get the strike back and clean up the stealth tanks. That Harvester actually survived. I thought that boy was dead for sure. One avatar on the low ground, maybe by accident or by negligence, but it's dead all the same. A weakened avatar, unprotected, no SAM sights in sight. As the Venom show up, supercharged particle beam has been finished, and the Hammerheads are going to have to head for the hills. Another avatar separated away from its defense will get knocked down on the low ground. A dig a grave for these two Avatar brothers. Meanwhile, we missed it, but the Vertigo Bombers came in and blasted down those Harvesters. Get the kill on the Husk as well. Ooh, Shock Trumpet has now given away three Avatars on this low ground. That's starting to add up to be a big mistake. Giving away one avatar, well, sometimes it happens. The pathing takes a unit in a direction you did not expect, and you're not quite paying attention enough to, no to notice every corner of the map all of the time. But when it happens three times, it becomes a lot more damage than just a simple accident. The MCV goes too far forward. Juggernauts and Hammerheads will find the kill. Venom's too late to the party as the Juggernauts slam the last shots home. And the Avatars step forward, but the MCV has already gone down. The Venoms will be here, and the Orca Strike was coming in to secure the kill. Vertigos will find their kills. One Juggernaut goes down. The second takes some healthy damage. The Predators trying to find their last shots, and it is a mess. It is a trade back and forth, but there's still a lot of Harvesters alive for Drive, and he is choking out Shock Trepid, keeping these fields under his control, means that Shock Trepid's bank has been dwindling over the last couple of minutes. The Blue Tiberium has all been harvested, and the green fields have pretty much expired. It's just the middle of the map that houses a lot of cash, and game number one will go to Drive. Shock Trepid fighting it out well but it's just not enough. And that's where Drive's experience and better history of games seems to give him an edge as we jump into game number two.
And game two takes us to the cliff sides of Atacama Road for the next battlefield in the north. Playing as the red marked of Kane. This is Shock Trepid. And in the south, playing the yellow GDI. Feeling phenomenal after a game one win. This is Drive. Shock Trepid was doing what he could to get his hands back in on the wheel and take control of that game one. But Drive just never let it happen. And now game two, Shock Trepid has a chance to take back a point, even up the score, and prove that he belongs on the same stage as Drive, Masterleaf, Futurama. We just haven't seen the tournament performance in Kane's Wrath from Shock Trepid as of yet. He's put out phenomenal games in practice, in show matches even, doing extremely well in Tib Wars, going to the finals there but never had his big day in the sun in Kane's Wrath. And it's always one of these heavy hitters who knocks him down. It's not like he's getting eliminated by No Pants McGee, you know, knocking him down for no reason. Shock Trepid is getting eliminated by these heavy hitters, and that is all he has left in front of him. Drive so many finals over the last couple of years and well, well this is too many awaken squads and these bikes are going to be the follow-up power plant to kind of block these off it's going to create a little bit of an awkward pathing situation and the bikes will be able to rotate around to the rear armor so they're getting big big damage on this harvester now the harvester goes for the heel but it's a little bit too late and it's another harvester popping on out what was drive thinking he really thought he could hold this off, and now he will pay the price as the refinery gets locked down. The War Factory, fortunately for Drive, did not get EMP'd. That would have been lights out on yet even more Harvesters, but no, it's just two. There's no chain EMP on the War Factory. Drive loses two Harvesters right out of the gate, but it does cost Shock Trepid the timing on some of his harvesters. He's going to be maybe a little bit slower, but not very much. Three bikes is not a big commitment, and he would love to have a fifth harvester, but that's what the second refinery at the natural expansion is for. Shock Trepid with a fantastic opening in game number two. Maybe Tears of Sorrow is just not his map. That was the only one that Phoenix won against Shock Trepid. And, you know, some... Oh, okay, never mind. It's not going to be a fourth refinery at the natural. Fourth refinery. It's not going to be a third refinery is what I meant to say. At the natural. It's going to be a double war factory right into this mass bike buggy. Not a lot of EMP support, but... Oh, for so fortunately for Drive, his foxhole spots out the attack nice and early. Bikes are going to be able to find some rear armor, but it's a double war factory from Drive as well. Shock Trepid fires off the first... First volley and drive hits back. It's going to be a trade. Pitbulls versus bike buggy, and that's an okay trade for drive as long as actually he's losing a lot of pitbulls, more pitbulls than the other guy is losing bikes, and that's never what you want to see. These bikes are actually going to be able to overwhelm these pitbulls. Where's the watchtower? It's a little bit late on the uptake here as drive is slow on the build of those defenses. Finally, it's here, and that is way more pit bulls than you would ever expect the GDI player to lose. Wow. Shock Trepid actually gets phenomenal damage in the first run and good damage in the second. What a great opening for Shock Trepid. His economy has not exploded as of yet. He's still just rolling four harvesters on his main field, but that is a great setup for game number two. You want to knock someone down? This is the way to do it. Not this random scorpion tank on the left side of the map. Not that. That wasn't the way to do it. I meant literally everything that happened before that in this game. Okay. Okay. What What are you doing? What? What is this? 
Great scout from Drive to spot out this move immediately, right as that MCV packs up. His rifleman happens to be moving through that field. I mean, it was a good scouting move regardless, but the timing was perfection. Getting a little bit lucky there as he sends in the scout, which is a good thing to do, and gets so lucky on that timing. Great scouts from Drive all over the map. His intel is really thorough. Uh, it kind of just tells him that he is massively far behind in where he would like to be, but the defense can be stitched up, and this could be where things turn around for Drive, and he gets back into control of this game. Pitbull step forward, one gets knocked down, trading out against buggies. It's not phenomenal because now the Scorpion tanks are here. They've got Dozer Blades. That's the purpose of that operation center from earlier. No EMPs coming through for Shock Trepid. He's doing this with pure vehicle firepower. And the first Harvester at the Natural Expansion is about to fall. But no, the shots have been so spread across so many targets that Shock Trepid has yet to find a kill on a Harvester. Finally, the Guardian Cannon comes up. The power comes back online. And Shock Trepid is hoping that he can take this game into the next stage with a counterattack at the main. Two Harvesters going down. Engineers stealing the tip spikes and it's pure chaos on the side of drive he gets knocked down with those attack bikes early on but it's not stopping there the carnage will not be stopping there and you better hope if you're a fan of drive that game number three is going to be looking better because it feels like game two is going to go shock trap its way Drive puts out the Predator tanks. He can keep up the pressure, but the damage has been done. So it's up to Drive to do the counter damage to Preds, locked down by an EMP, and there's more of that to follow. If Shock Trep at once, he can cycle out this Shredder turret to get another EMP right onto the front line. The Predator tanks fall to pieces. The retreat is being brought low by those shot down by those tip troopers. Once in a while, we see the Trib Trooper rise to the occasion and find its place in this game. But Beam Cannons are now on the front line. The War Factory is getting sapped of its health, and the Sonic Emitter has too many targets to shoot at. These Scorpion tanks dodging shot after shot, encircling the forces of Drive. And Shock Trepid says, game one is yours, but game two is mine. This Guardian Cannon from earlier, a great investment there from Shock from Drive. It's getting more value than he anticipated. More Sonic emitters to try and sew up the defense and Drive just cannot get a break. Shock Trepid brought the aggression early on and he has not stopped in this game. Scorpion tanks are starting to fall apart, but that's just an opportunity for the beam cannons to finally get their critical damage done at the front door. The backstab finding a juggernaut, but not much more. The back off as that MCV takes the third instead of keeping up the pressure. The beam cannons are gonna have to find the damage. The rocket squads sneaking around the side. Are you kidding me? The rocket squads will force that juggernaut back and what almost turned into a disaster for Shock Trepid turns into an even trade, if anything. So many of these harvesters are extremely low, hit or a hit or two away from death, and this one scorpion tank is gonna be a hero. He will write back home and tell of his glories on the battlefield, fighting for Kane because of how many harvesters that guy just killed way more than you would expect as the rocket squads keep the front line alive. These juggernauts which should be knocking down that MCV of Shock Trepid are still wasting their time trying to clear out the main base of Drive. Another juggernaut down. Another takes its place. Two is the number on the front line and Drive finally can push away these beam cannons but it has been a costly fight behind this shock trap it adds on another refinery at the natural adds on another refinery at the third his economy is not rolling at the third it's just at the natural it was a double air tower a double air tower transition 
Not what I thought was gonna happen. Why did he move his MCB back there to go for a double air tower? Because he's shock tripping and apparently he's just a little bit crazy here in these games. His engineer snipes are perfect and his husk kills will not be sniped. Juggernauts don't shoot up and Drive is watching his bank account draw zero as he sends engineer after engineer to its death. And yeah, Venoms, Normally, they have supercharged particle beams, but these ones apparently don't even need it as the Firehawks are called in to try and save this game from disaster. More and more Harvesters will pay the price. One slingshot will finally save Drive, but no, the Venoms don't care. The Venoms are just gonna gun down Harvesters in the face of a slingshot, which will eventually rank all the way up to Heroic. And Shock Trepid is losing control of this game, it seems, inch by inch, as the Juggernauts move forward and find another building to knock down. I cannot believe how wild this game turned almost from the first minute. It looked like Shock Trepid was going to close it out, but now he's got Venom slow roasting Harvesters way far away from his front line. Vertigo's now kind of in a proxy airfield, which is not what anyone had on their bingo card. And the air tower does go down. The Vertigo will not get sniped by that slingshot. And these two Tibbs bikes captured so long ago have turned out to be pivotal. The last Venom goes down. This Vertigo just polluting the map with its attack markers and a stealth tank. One random stealth tank. So much damage has been done before this stealth tank rolls up and he's going to get the glory of knocking down just about everything that Drive has. He has... Uh, okay. All right. Drive got on a harvester. He was almost dead in the water. His MCV is on the move to a third. And I guess this tech lab is just going to buy time. Stealth tank could sandwich these juggernauts. And this MCV needs to get out of the danger zone. As the Orca Strike comes in, it will get the confirmed kill on that tier three. But every single juggernaut goes down. The Firehawks are going to have to find some way to win the game by themselves because there is nothing left on the ground. The husks all go down. That barracks was supposed to revive the artillery of drive. And it just has to be sold off in an embarrassment drive. Will tap out. The fire sale comes in and Shock Trepid evens the score on Atacata Road. What a game for Shock Trepid. That is not how I thought that was going to go, but he is writing his own history and Drive will not get an easy walkover victory. And now it takes us to Tournament Dust Bowl No Poker in the North. Lane GDI, Lane Yellow. This is Drive. And in the South, having a bit of a Cinderella story as the red marked of Kane. This is Shock Trepid. I cannot tell you how happy I am that it is not a 4-0 for Drive. A 4-1 would also be sad, but a 4-0 for Drive, where Shock Trepid comes through all of these players, gets knocked down to the lower bracket after making the top eight in the upper bracket, and then fights, 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 gets through, gets through, gets through, and defeated by Drive in a 4-0. That would be heartbreaking. 4-1 also wouldn't be great, but... At least he's got one point on the board. Hope remains alive. Drive the player with more history behind his name, more wins in his corner. But Shock Trumpet is not going out without, without a fight. And that is something we have seen in almost every single game, every series, every player is taking this event seriously. They are playing these games out sometimes so slow and defensive that they just don't want to give away the advantage that they have, but they are never giving up. Even when the game seems hopelessly lost, they still fight it out. There is no one calling in sick, phoning it in and saying, eh, I don't care. It feels like people are actually showing up. Bike's going to come in. 
They're going to get a kill on this APC. No Rifleman inside means that that APC does virtually nothing. Pitbulls will come out. No EMP on that War Factory. So once again, and look at that. That front armor plus the repair means that these bikes will do almost nothing. Good dodging by drive. And that is the difference between game two and game three. Shock Trepid opens with three bikes, which isn't some huge crazy commitment, but when you get the phenomenal damage of game number two, it's so much easier to roll it into a win. Whereas here on Tournament Dust Bowl, we have a different story. Easy move over to your natural expansion on this map. And uh, for those of you, again, who might be a little bit newer to Kane's Wrath, the official version of the map of this map that ships with the game has the tip spikes here in the middle of the map. So they are a complete split between the two uh, spawning positions. Uh, these pit bulls actually going to be able to jump on a couple of these bikes and just dumpster them. So it is going to have to be buggies because they can survive more than one volley from these pit bulls. But the original version of the map it was a little bit of a, a roll of the dice. And so, generally speaking, players didn't like that. It does mean that when you open up with an engineer, you could just get completely caught unawares because your opponent went like four riflemen onto the same spike as you, and they just built way more riflemen than you would normally build because it is a poker map. And so, the generally uh, agreed upon decision was to move the spikes into the corner. So now they're very far away from your main, but they are a secure capture for each player. And both variants of the map, both versions of the map are actually in the map pool. So you can play either one and 99 times out of 100, I don't remember the last time I saw the non-poker variant, people prefer the non-poker version. It feels like there's a little bit less RNG, you have a little bit more control and, of course, your opponent can still outplay you, but at least you feel like you're in control in those first moments. So that's when we say no poker on a map. There's two or three different maps in the pool where the tip spikes are a little bit too close to your opponent. And so in the community-made modifications, they will move those tip spikes into more secure locations. And that's just generally what the uh, competitive scene has decided is the way to go. And I feel like, hey, if it leads to better games, I am all for it. And I don't know that I necessarily want the games decided by who wins a random poker match at the very, you know, ten, first 10 seconds of the game. And then one of the players is just behind by, you know, 5,000 credits right from the beginning. Uh, tip spikes do tick up over time. So, you know, maybe it's not exactly 5K, but that does add up if your opponent kills your engineer and gets the tip spike right from the beginning. Attacks, attack bikes and buggies rolling up the right side of the map. A little bit of a trade back and forth as these two players have been posturing near each other's bases, near each other's expansions, and neither one has been able to find an opening or find a weakness. AP ammo on the way. Command post is online. Tier 3 is up for Shock Trepid. And, uh, well, when you go for the air tower, it does mean your tier three is delayed that little bit more. We can see it's probably about 60, 70% of the way done for drive. Orca Strike comes across the map, which is a lovely indicator to Shock Trepid. Hey, Hammerheads, Orcas, something like that is on the way. And indeed, the first one gets shut down as Shock Trepid finds a kill with a couple of loose bikes and buggies crossing the map. The obelisk has been spotted by drive and there is going to be the catalyst missile that finds a harvester and a refinery just a refinery the harvester down to about half health and the bikes not able to finish it off shock trumpet finds a win in game number two without a single one click but here in game number three he will get the one clicks if that was seed tiberium that was a lot of cash that just disappeared from Shock Trepid. That Seed Tiberium costs like 500 to call in, but it is worth so much more. It's worth probably three or four grand. And it just 
disappeared. So Shock Trap was expecting to get a nice cash boost from that, and that just disappeared as Pitbulls are now tearing down his Harvesters one by one. Their health bars are disappearing, and the Bulldogs do get called in. These reinforcements materializing for Drive as the pressure keeps up at the natural expansion. Bane Detonation fires off, but if you don't have anything to finish off those Harvesters, then the Bane Detonation just makes them weaker, and they keep on working just as they were before. You may feel good about those red health bars, but it doesn't mean a whole lot. Harvester after Harvester going down, Stealth Tanks showing up, but when Stealth Tanks are your defense back at home, you're not in a good spot. Harvester's exploding, the mine drop gets some extra damage done, and fortunately for Shock Trap, he finally clears out his natural expansion. Five Harvesters, I think, total on the map for Shock Trepid. Last Harvester chewing up those mines as well. And when you've only got four Harvesters on the map this late in the game, you better hope that your third base is going to save you. And right now, Shock Trepid is not particularly close to a well-established third. He might be able to sneak out a refinery here, but that is not much compared to a Marv and all of these harvesters that are online working actively for drive. Double stealth tank rolling up. No tip core for Shock Trepid. He would love to have that tip core as these stealth tanks get cleaned up by the pit bulls, but no. The pit bulls are a little bit too slow. The stealth tanks need to keep moving. Shock Trepid, keep them moving in the top left hand corner, though. Drive is going to find another stealth tank stabbing him in the back. He cannot make himself secure from these stealth tanks, it seems. And if only he could get out this Marv, he would have a nice anchor for his harvesters, a nice shield to keep his harvesters safe. He cannot kill this stealth tank. It literally has evaded everything that he has tried, which is sending two predator tanks after it and nothing to detect stealth. Drive almost coming up short. And now Shock Trepid is going to try and bleed this Marv dry. Drive does have good cash in the bank, but so does Shock Trepid as he has been able to establish his third unharassed, untouched by Drive, but Drive is not going to be giving up the right side of the map without a fight, and Stealth Harvesters feel like they are what is keeping Shock Trepid in the game. Stealth has been his friend. Stealth has been his strength. That is like what is anchoring his gameplay in this particular match. Power Plant's going to be going down, and the EMP will be denied. Vertigo Bomber's going to be coming through. More Harvesters could be going down. Splash damage is big as two Harvesters go down, and the Vertigos get a free pass on their first run. And these Obelisks clean up another, and suddenly, Shock Trepid goes from near destruction as he was trying to get that third up and running to the fact that he has killed almost every single harvester of drive. He can sell off this MCB, lose this position, and his economy will still probably be stronger than drives. His ground army may not be. His ground army probably can't fight a Mar, but his economy is stronger. So if this game goes on long enough, okay, this, this is just Mistake Town USA. Bye-bye. Two Harvesters given away for free. I thought Christmas was over, but little did you know these games were actually played in 2022. And it was, you know, past Christmas, but close to Christmas time. Actually, these games might have been 2023. Yeah, that's okay. The, the tournament did bleed over into the new year a little bit here, but it's still that gift-giving season, and sometimes you got to give your opponent a donation of a harvester or two. The Juggernaut is not going to be long for this world as the Vertigos come in. The Engineer is not far behind, and that's a good move from Drive to keep this front line moving, to keep the assault on the way, and the Vertigo barely misses its opportunity to kill that husk, and it dies on exit. Like I said, the economy of Shock Trepid may be stronger, but his ground army is not. 
And indeed, he has essentially no ground army at all. The Vertigos were the thing anchoring him still in this game. And the stealth tanks have seemingly run out of rockets, run out of lives as the Grenadiers clear out the buildings in the middle of the map. And this, oh, this is all of the tech. Operations Center, Secret Shrine, upgraded power plants, tier three, everything. In this corner, it is going to be a full tech reset for Shock Trepid. And this is where it's not going to be difficult, not going to be easy to come out of this game with a win. Drive gives up a game, but it looks like he is back in control. Uh, Ada actually didn't kill off the power plant. I thought for sure he was going to knock down that power plant, hopefully to take Shock Trepid into low power mode so that then the, ob the obelisk stops killing units. All right, well, the refinery is also a very good target. Pitbull's rolling forward. Pitbull's might actually be able to catch this MCB. A couple of loose rockets here could do some big, big damage, but it's going to be the mortars that are going to have to finish off that MCB. Instead, the harvesters will be the target as Drive can't decide what he wants to knock down next. There's so many buildings and so many targets that are seemingly free, nearly undefended as Shock Trepid falls apart. The GG comes in, and Shock Trepid will drop game number three. Drive has found the lead in the map score once again. The economy so close, so neck and neck for most of that game. Shock Trepid pulling ahead at the end, but not in the unit's graph. He never was able to capitalize on his economic advantage and roll that into actual units on the field, and that will do it. Let's jump into the next one. And that'll take us to pipeline problems for game four. Once again, the chance to be the difference maker, but for the man in the north, it is going to be his shot to go into match point and potentially have his eyes on the grand final against Futurama. In the north, playing the yellow GDI, this is Drive. If he could meet his old pal Futurama, that would be an amazing grand final that we would be building towards a best of 13, I believe, for the finisher. But in the south, this guy is standing in his way. The red marked of Cain, this is Shock Trepid. Who will probably have more total games played on this map than Drive. Drive is going to be more familiar with those... Okay, they're both calling their harvesters back early. But uh, Drive is going to have more experience with the more traditional Kane's Wrath maps, those that have been in the 1.02 plus pool for a while longer. And Shock Trepid, every time one of these maps from Tib Wars comes out, he is going to have a lot of experience on this. And it may not make a difference. He may still lose this game. But this is the battlefield he has chosen to play on. This is where he wants to fight out the next game to have a chance at evening up the score. Riflemen lose the fight against Awakened Squads basically every single time. And... The transition into the green field can sometimes be a little bit awkward. Some players like to go for the War Factory over at the blue. Other players like to go for a faster green refinery before the War Factory. Or sometimes they skip the third refinery over here and then they just go two over here and a faster War Factory and a faster green refinery. But these two guys coming out really close to even. For a Marked of Cain versus GDI match, they are mirroring each other pretty darn well. It's not a crazy aggressive play, and also it is comfort picks for both of these players. They have stuck with their factions. There's no switching it around. There's no mind control. There's nothing like that to worry about. The one clicks present in that last game, but they didn't earn Shock Trepid the win. He spent the cash, and he wasn't able to win the game in the end. But then, you look at the Atacama Road game, he gets the win there without a single one-click. The back and forth of these two players has been delightful to see, 
And they are definitely on my list for after this event, potentially seeing a show match from them. But we have got more phenomenal games to get to. It's really sad when we come to these last couple of rounds and it's like, oh, actually, I kind of want all of these guys to win the tournament, to be there in the grand finals. But it's like, we really can only have one person win and two people in the grand finals. So, like, we got to start knocking people out at some point. I just... It doesn't feel right that Shock, Trepid, and Drive, with how phenomenally they have played across this whole tournament, one of these guys is going home today. One of these guys is getting knocked out for the last time. They fought it out well in the upper bracket. Drive getting knocked down by Dune Tiger way earlier on than anyone would have expected. And now he's here. He, he had his rematch with Dune Tiger. He rose to the occasion, as it would be, and uh, he, he knocked down Dune Tiger, and now he is here in the final, well, in the final set of games against Shock Trepid. And also Drive, knocking down Rex as well in the lower bracket. I mean, eliminating Rex, who was a relatively new to us hopeful, a, uh, a Chinese player who came over to Canada and now plays on the same server as many of the players were familiar with. That's one of those things where pretty much every Command & Conquer game has a larger player base in China than most of the rest of the world combined. But because there's a pretty stiff language barrier there and we play on different servers or different services, we don't interact very much and we don't see a lot of crossover. And that's something in Red Alert 3, we see a lot more crossover of the players. Catalyst Missile finds the refinery and the Harvester goes down as well. So it was either weakened or it was eliminated by the stealth tank. But the Pitbulls will get the kill there. Firehawks come through. They find the tier three, so no more stealth tanks. One Firehawk will pay the price there as these boys head on home. It is two airfields worth of Firehawks out on the field. And Drive and Shock Trepid, they are ready to fight it out on the right side of the map. Ooh, gets the Firehawk right as he goes down to the deck. Every Firehawk that goes down is worth more than a Venom in the pace of the game. I don't know that you want to lose every single Venom, but... Getting, uh, getting all of those Firehawks is extremely nice for Shock Trepid. He doesn't want that Strato Fighter coming across the board and cleaning up those buildings. He wants his high-tech units to stay online. And, oh, the Stealth Tank gets found. It does reveal itself by killing a Harvester, but the Pitbulls will close the distance and get the kill. Once again, the Strato Fighter comes in. And the Firehawks will find that. No, they don't have quite enough damage. He either spread the bombings out too far so that the repair was able to keep that online or something missed about his, uh, his count and he actually sent in one too few Firehawks. Maybe he didn't refuel all the way. He was missing one bomb. So it was the correct number of Firehawks, but he was minus one bomb from where it should have been because of the pressure. But at any rate... He's going to try again. The Venoms are moving into a defensive position, and the Engineer will get the cap on the Tech Lab. But it's anti-air missiles. The Vertigo, the Venoms come through, and the Firehawks are looking to clean them up. Passing once and then again, and Strato fighting out as the Pitbulls rock up to the third base. Pitbulls are pretty much undefeated in this Harvester-killing game here in this series. They have found so many kills over the course of this game, but not too many more in the last minute or so. And these Pitbulls will clean out one more Harvester as the stealth tanks try and knock them down. But the Pitbulls can now turn their guns on the double stealth tank defense that Shock Trepid has made. Drive, keeping his MCV here, hasn't deployed a second refinery. That might be a bit of a mistake. We saw Futurama in that set against Masterleaf, winning game number seven with a slow crawl from the north, pushing out those GDI units one by one. The Pitbull's coming in for a second volley, and these stealth tanks are not ready and waiting in position. 
unfortunately, the damage has been spread across almost every single Harvester that the Pitbulls have not found a kill yet. Stealth tanks roll up. One stealth tank knocked down. The second one will help with these Venoms to trade out against the Pitbulls, and this stealth tank does go down but the Venoms will survive. The Pit Bulls go down as the reinforcements come in. Drive makes a mess of the attack. He gets the kills, he gets the trades, but it's not the Harvesters that he wanted. Firehawks coming through. Every bit of defense has disappeared suddenly as Drive has nothing opposing him. He's got three or four Pit Bulls here and there is just no ground army from Shock Trepid. What happened to all of his forces? He never got that third base up and rolling. He was never able to unharassed harvest that field. Meanwhile, Drive has just got the opposite problem. He's had no harassment, but it's been a pure parking lot in his third base. The rest of his, the rest of his base has basically been uh, shelled by the sh by the stealth tanks, but his third unassaulted and a parking lot. Just a big slab of pavement, useless as these sneaky little harvesters just sit around waiting for each other to get out of the way. And I mean, at least they aren't bugged, so they are harvesting, they are refining one by one, but it's just, if you had two refineries, that process would be alleviated. Uh, engineer sneaking down the right side of the map. You love to see it from Drive. Pitbull's gonna be going down once again. Drive defeated by the Venoms of Shock Trepid. And actually, the Firehawks did find the tier three. It was hidden next to the Blue Tiberium, but Drive found it. And that's where the Venoms weren't hanging out, was next to that Blue Tiberium, as yet another Harvester lines up, ready to unload its Tiberium. Shock Trepid never getting a Redeemer engineering facility, never going into the ultra late game, relying so much on the Venoms to clear out wave after wave of air units. These stealth tanks will also be able to come in and finish the job. One Firehawk down, the other two will escape. Pitbulls trying to trade out with the, sh with the stealth tanks. And for now, the stealths turn back south, trading against these harvesters and dodging the Sonic Emitter. Okay, the engineer did drop did get did get dropped. It will eventually find its home in that tip spike. And now the front line will be moved further forward by Shock Trepid. He's gonna be so annoyed at losing that tip spike. He doesn't even have a barracks nearby. He might have to build one just to recapture it. But for now, Drive will clear the skies. Once again, the MCV taking a bit of damage. Those pit bulls with their mortars do a surprising amount to buildings. That's why they can be very powerful. And the one clicks. I feel like this, if, if he could have clicked this refinery again, it would have been a massive reset to Drive. But... He just hasn't been able to do it. Shock Trumpet is going to try and push forward that build radius. He is going to try and bleed Drive dry with a war of attrition. He takes down the airfield. Finally, the stealth tanks have got the big kill that they wanted. They've been able to pick off a couple of harvesters, but shutting down those Firehawks takes so much off the table for Drive. And with the pressure at the front, it feels like Shock Trumpet is finally ready to close out the game. Never got... Tibcore, as much as he has relied on those stealth tanks, on those units, when it would benefit from Tibcore, he never got it. And Drive falls apart. He never gets the mark. He never stabilizes that third. The GG comes out and Shock Trepid evens up the score once again. Drive gets a win. Shock Trepid strikes back and gets his own. And that sends us to Tournament Los Angeles for our next Battleground. A map that has given us a ton of phenomenal games over the last two years. In the north, switching it up to Nod, sticking with Red. This is Shock Trepid. And in the south, as the yellow GDI, this is Drive. So we get to see a slight variation here from Shock Trepid if Marked of Cain is his comfort pick. That is what he's been playing a lot of in this tournament. Well, Nod isn't 
that much different. Maybe he wants to make use of those scorpions, those later game scorpion upgrades. Maybe he wants the option of having some flame tanks. He's just, you know, doesn't want to commit to black hand in that he wants to still have some air power. But he wants those flame units. He wants the better scorpions late game. Could be a whole combination of things. Not too many particular builds from these two in this series. It's been pretty straightforward. Even that game two where Atacama Road was a big, big win early on for Shock Trepid, he didn't do anything too crazy. I mean, three bikes at the beginning of the game is not some insane pressure build where it's like, oh, this is a really specific timing. This is something that you don't see very often. And he's obviously prepped for this tournament. It's just you know, kind of a very light pressure opening. It's not even really a build, it's just an opening variation. By the way, if you are unfamiliar with this map, there are two EMP control centers, but they are super, super far out, way on the edge. And well, there is also mutant hovels right next to your base, tempting you. But of course, in a tournament game, we basically never will see the mutant hovels grabbed up by these players. EMP control centers, every once in a while, they come into play. And a little bit more rarely than every once in a while, they do make a difference in a game. Of course, we love to see the moments when they do get a money shot that just lands on a bunch of units or destroys a whole crowd of aircraft, but it doesn't happen that often. Pitbulls from Drive going to be rolling up to the base of Shock Trepid. Looks like not a lot of counter pressure on the other side. He does have the scouting militant keeping an eye on these harvesters. So he does at least have that. Couple of shots from these pit bulls, but the heal of that war factory is gonna be enough. They might dive in for a second pass. They do see the second war factory. So that is good to know. They really do wanna know that there is a second war factory here. One pit bull goes down. Harvester absorbs the first round of shots, and that means that one or two bikes might survive longer than they otherwise would have if those shots had been aimed at the bikes. But now the pit bulls have begun their snowball. Doesn't look like any more reinforcements are crossing the map for drive. So these five pit bulls, well now four pit bulls, are what he is hoping to get some damage done with. Well, one harvester and a number of bikes is a good start for Drive. He sees the double war factory and he slows it down. Any bike buggy, buggy pressure that was going to be coming off the, across the map is now so much weaker than if those pit bulls had not cleared out every single bike as it emerged from that war factory. And you gotta give it to Drive for coming across the map and keeping up just the right amount of pressure to still be able to get his third up in timely fashion, in a timely fashion behind that. It's not like he sacrificed his economy to get that little bit of pressure, that little bit of damage done. He did it and he followed it up with a sharply timed third refinery over at his natural expansion. The double war factory has not got a lot of value for Shock Trepid yet. Drive did such a good job in shutting that down. And in this game, where it is definitely the momentum setter for this series after they have gone back and forth in the way that they have. Okay, that's not what I was expecting. Refinery on the natural defeat all of the units that have vision, drop a third and go for the MCV cell. That is a risky move, but it's not a totally insane one. He's also stealing Blue Tiberium from the middle of the map. I think that was two Harvesters worth that he got from the middle of the map. So this actually might work. Shock Trumpet has an opportunity, but it is not going to be one click dependent. If he does enough damage, he can roll this into another MCV and just transition back out. This is a big commitment. This is not a, an all in in like a, in like a, I'm dead sense, but this is an all in. And so the Predator tank kills do matter. Two of them get jumped on. They get shut down super fast. The third one finds some kills, but not before the bikes knock him down before the next kill comes out. Hammerheads are now here, but they're going to be a momentary distraction, and they don't get much done considering that the Predator tanks were a few moments too late. 
too slow to the front line as these Predator tank reinforcements will help clear up this attack. But that's only the first wave. The last Harvester has fallen. And this is where if Drive sees the vein detonation on top of his forces, he knows what's going on. But no vein detonation. He doesn't necessarily have all of the pieces queued in just yet. He may be sent in a rifleman at some point to get a second look at the base of Shock Trepid, but he may not realize the situation that Shock Trepid has put himself in. Never mind, Shock Trepid backs off. He's going to be looking for another opportunity, another opening. Shock Trepid is hoping that he can find a big win. Killing that Reclamator hub would be a big win. Sniping power plants, well, we'll take sort of anything we can get at this point. Shock Trepid, his tournament life isn't on the line, but losing this game this deep in the tournament, this deep in the series, would be a morale killer, and now he has done it. Finally, the back and forth as these guys chase them, we chase each other around like a cat and a mouse. Well, the cat has struck, and it turns out he's a lion as he encircles the forces of Drive, and Shock Trepid crushes Harvester after Harvester. The Predator tanks are making a heroic defense, and if the Scorpion tank numbers weren't quite as good, then this might be a hold for Drive. The Predators get knocked down one by one, and the fire sale is gonna have to come in as the last harvester expires. The bikes go heroic and the railguns come in. Railguns so late in the game and now a moment too late because there's only three predator tanks, two predator tanks left on the map. One predator tank. And that is it, Railguns, the first time I have seen them in this tournament, and they're so short-lived. Shock Trepid finds the momentum here in game number six. He knocks Drive down, and he will be headed into game six. I think I said game six. I meant game five earlier, but game six with the match point advantage. advantage. I can't even speak, Shock Trepid. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Look at that. Look at that structures tab. A flat line from Shock Trepid. That guy just pulled that off. Oh, Drive would have been unkillable if that attack came one minute later. One minute later, and then suddenly railguns just blaze that bike buggy army to bits but that will do it for game five and it'll send us into match point for shock trepid and tournament crater will be where the match point either wins the series or we go to the ace match for the last game of this set in the north returning to marked of kane Lane Red, this is Shock Trepid. For the first time in this series, he has a point advantage. He is no longer playing catch up. He is in control. And in the south, plain yellow, plain GDI, as always, this is Drive. The overdog, but not by much anymore. Suddenly, when it really matters, Shock Trepid gets the point advantage, and now he has... Oh, look at that. The MCV took a little bit of damage. We talked about the Hand of Nod ball thing. You can see here, the Hand of Nod did just a smidgen of damage to the Conyard. Just took a little bit of that health off. Okay, both players grabbing all their tip spikes. Okay, yes. Okay, there was that one game where Master Leaf... Uh, queued his engineer over here, and then the engineer sat there for like 25 minutes. And it was one of those things where it's like, it was a phenomenal game, but if Master Leaf had grabbed that tip spike, it would have been that much better for him. But in this game, everyone remembers, no problems there. Shock Trepid. I mean, if he goes down 4-3, I feel like it will, be ha it will have been a well-earned fight. And uh, going down against Drive is not anything to be ashamed of. Obviously, every player wants to win. Every player considers it like some 
dramatic, terrible failure if they get anything other than first. And of course, the reality is only one player can be first. And I, as a as a observer, consider it no small feat to go up against Dry and to go as far and as deep in a tournament as Shock Trumpet has. And if he is to fall at this last hurdle, that would not be a bad performance in my eyes. But Drive, he's the one who actually has to prove himself in this game. No more mistakes. If he lets one more game slip away, he is out of the tournament. After knocking down Phoenix, uh, after knocking down Rex, knocking down Dune Tiger, taking out so many players in this tournament, he himself is now with his tournament life on the line, bringing three pit bulls to the natural expansion of Shock Trepid. Powers down the refinery to keep that harvester safe. And well, Drive probably would have liked if he showed up a couple of seconds later so that the harvester was out and exposed. He will take the damage on the refinery and take the safety of knowing his own harvester is getting further and further ahead in that refinery timing. EMP lands, catches two of those pit bulls, and two is better than none. So getting the kill on two pit bulls is going to be a nice consolation prize there for Shock Trepid. But no, it's only one pit bull because the other two have snuck into the main base and are finding themselves some juicy harvesters. Shock Trepid returns to Mark of Cain. He switches it back from Nod to Mock for game number six. And his first EMP has landed, but also... His harvester's taking a lot of damage. He's uh, he's not feeling too good after all of those pit bulls just taking pot shots at his harvesters like that. Second refinery is up and running. Things are starting to equalize. All of the early game differences have, uh, you know, sort of come out in the wash. EMP lands. Oh, that might have been a... Was that from the sky? Or was that just a misclick from Shock Trepid where he EMP'd his own... Scorpions, and then the pit bulls got a kill. Because if so, that's pretty funny that the pit bulls got the kill on that scorpion there. Both players capturing their EMP control centers nice and early means that we do have an opportunity for that EMP control center to play a vital role in capturing these two predator tanks. And yep. Predator tanks will get caught. They might even get killed as the Fanatics come out and the Scorpion tanks close the distance. The Orca Strike will come in. Tag the refinery more than the Harvester, but that's okay for Drive. You take the chance, you roll the dice, you hope you get lucky with the Harvester timing, but you never do know for certain one squad of fanatics from Shock Trepid, and then no more. I love that. Just one because he had that EMP fired off, and he knew that he could get the kill on the Predator tank, but he just needed it to happen quickly. And now Shock Trepid moves to the other side of the map. Hammerheads are here. They're going to be able to get the kill on the Tib Troopers. Shut down of that. Shut down of the Rocket Squads. And Drive is looking like he's back in the driver's seat with these Scorpion tanks exploding one by one. Drive gets a catch and a kill on that expedition force of Shock Trepid. Three rocket squads in that bunker. It's gonna to be tough to crack. He will pay the price with the Bulldogs. The splash damage coming in there as well, and the Hammerheads are now going to be absorbing those shots. So this is a nice early warning system for Shock Trepid to know that this big force is coming to his front door. But it will be the Stealth Tank going for the backstab once again. No Tib Core missiles, but the combination of the Stealth Tank and the Catalyst missile will knock down two Harvesters before this Stealth Tank expires. And it's only one Pitbull, so the Stealth Tank can win that 1v1 if he should take it. But no, he will just fire upon... Oh my gosh, the Harvester gets the kill as Shock Trepid has his own problems back at home to deal with. It's going to be the Obelisk that is his one answer. The Stealth Tank comes in, the Predators get a kill, and they're going to be looking for a second Harvester to knock down as he tries to unload that Tiberium. The Stealth will save Shock Trepid once again. No Stealth Detection for Drive to clean up those Harvesters. EMP cleans up a Predator tank. 
Another Predator tank goes down, and the Redeemer will make a return to the battlefield. These games between these two players have been so early and... Uh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, here come the Pitbulls. Here come the Hammerheads. They find two stealth tanks. Nothing feels better for a GDI player than knocking down stealth tanks one by one like that knowing that they are not going to be there to backstab you, but he doesn't get all of them. At least two stealth tanks have survived, and now Drive sees it as well. The natural expansion will transition into a third, but it is a slow transition for Drive. Wow, I did not realize how far behind in the tech Drive is. He, he actually doesn't have tier three. His Harvester is just sitting there. He has a Harvester off the line, and he went for another refinery. So his economy is going to be booming. It's going to be slightly weaker by like 10% than it would be. Hopefully this Venom does make Drive notice that that Harvester is just sitting there. Yes, it does. Perfect. Gets it back to work. A little bit of a misclick there from Drive. He lost out on some mining time, but I don't think that's the end of the world. I am so worried about his position on the tech front. He has a command post. I love that. He's had that for a long time, but another refinery, another harvester goes down. And the tier three is no closer for drive. Another hammerhead gets eliminated, and these pit bulls are now going to try and chase down this stealth tank and take it down. Orca Strike comes in, big chunk of health off of that air tower, and the Redeemer secures the position of that MCV. Wouldn't it be insane? if he killed off a bridge as that Redeemer was crossing it. But it will not be. Stealth tanks seem to be the bane of Drive's existence. Shock Truppin has gotten so much damage done with these stealth tanks. They keep getting locked down, but that EMP will find the refinery, will find the harvesters, and almost all of the defense for Drive as well. He cannot keep these harvesters alive. And now the Redeemer shows up. Rage Gen will fire off. Most of these units have already been given an attack command, but it's going to be the Watchtowers tearing down their own infantry and wasting time as this Redeemer can engage with these units and just waste their time as the obelisks come up and the shock trip at size stealth tanks find another harvester kill drives hope of staying in this tournament is falling away as shock trumpet has played this game out almost perfectly and drive now forced to fire sale he's out of the game shock trumpet will take it for two the fire sale comes in and gg says drive oh my gosh shock trepid the comeback from the lower bracket will get his chance to take down master leaf in the losers bracket finals are you kidding me shock trepid rises to the occasion and let's jump into that match right now and that will take us to Tournament Odyssey for game one of a best of nine. The series are getting longer and longer. We've had our fill of best of fives. We've seen some best of sevens, but now we have a best of nine here for the lower bracket finals. Who will return to the grand finals to face off against Futurama? Will it be the yellow Traveler 59 in the north? Will it be Master Leaf? Or will it be the rising star in the red plane, Mark Dove Kane? Will it be Shock Trepid? An amazing set of games for Shock Trepid to have come through relentless in his pursuit of this grand finals and it feels like drive was the final boss but he wasn't and not even masterly is the final boss shock trepid has to beat drive and masterly and then futurama he's beaten one can he take down the next and masterly after several years of very limited performance 
tournament performance. Again, we talked about because he's been focusing on other projects, he has a chance to return to the Grand Finals and to face off once again against Futurama. That shot at redemption, that shot at revenge. And in his way is Shock Trepid. I feel like we need to do a little head versus heart because my head says Master Leaf will take it. But my heart wants to vote for Shock Trepid, wants to say that Shock Trepid will come through. And it's like, I know, I know that I should choose Master Leaf, but I so want to see Shock Trepid have his moment in the sun and come into the Winter Championship, a player that no one would have picked to go to the Grand Finals. And then him go there. Master Leaf, a couple of people had him on their list. He's always in the talks when you say, who's the greatest player of all time? Sure, Technique and Bike Rush, they're there in those talks. But someone else is Master Leaf, who changed the course of competitive play, not once or twice, but probably four or five or six times, who has supported both the competitive and, uh, you know, the not-so-competitive scene with, well, I guess it's still the competitive scene, but, like, you know, with the with the 4K texture pack, with his uh, additions for the 1.02 Plus most recent release, he's been doing some things that aren't just playing the game in tournaments. And so it's great to see him have his shot at the Grand Finals once again. And so I guess this is another opportunity. Ooh, Engineer Snipe. Always nice when you get one of those, but he doesn't go for it. He dives instead on the Harvesters. He's going to be able to pick up one, and the time for chatting is over because Master Leaf gets one Harvester. And what a phenomenal way to start out this game, to start out this series. It's a best of nine. And he gets a Harvester. The second wave of this attack will be waiting for an opportunity to show up because there's a couple of Seeker Tanks at the main. And then there's a second wave of descents making their way down the right edge of the map. The EMP comes in, and these extremely weak Seeker Tanks will fall to the bikes and the buggies. The last one will go down. Master Leaf having his chance in, at the Grand Finals, but we do have to say thanks to Rotter Milan for donating the $1,000 prize pool and to Bike Rush Owns for putting all of the time into organizing and hosting this event. And also to Drive, who made the key art for the event. But more Harvesters are on the spit. More Harvesters will be roasted and toasted before the game is over. How many, how big can the kill count get for Master Leaf? Right now, I think it's up to four, but he's looking for five. He's looking for more. He's never satisfied as he hopes that Shock Trepid would be a worthy opponent because his harvesters are not. Shock Trepid on the other side of the map. No real counter damage. He's going for the cross map, but that was the saddest cross map we have ever seen. It wasn't really a counter attack. It was just a couple of random units who were probably there for like scouting reasons and just got forgotten about. Shock Trepid is going to look to get his feet back under him. Master Leaf keeping his bank account alive, rolling up past 3K as he keeps Shock Trepid's harvester numbers low. Shock Trepid having to waste time rebuilding those harvesters time and time and time again. Looks like he can sell off some buildings, though, to get himself back into this thing. Tier 3 is up. Tech Lab most likely going for that supercharged particle beams. And this is not the Traveler 59 style of play that we have seen in a couple of the other games in this event. This is extremely active, fast, and fluid everywhere on the map, making use of those fast leg descents. And that doesn't mean the cultists and the prodigy won't make an appearance, but it does mean the first part of this game has been fought and won off the back of descents and seekers. It is a powerful combination. And in this case, it's working out very well against the bikes and the buggies. 
Couple of more harvesters are under threat here on the edge of the field. Shock Trepid can't keep him alive and Masterleaf can't help himself from killing them off. The Venoms will get the clear, sweeping the descents under the rug and the Seeker Tanks will follow. The third is on the way for Masterleaf as it is for Shock Trepid as well, but it's just a little slower for Shock Trepid. His bank account is a little weaker. He would be loving to get any kind of cross map damage done, even if it was just going for a one click to knock down a refinery, but he has no such opportunity. He doesn't have the bankroll to make it happen either. The blink back of three of those uh, the Prodigy is uh, a little bit too close, but wow, these disc mechas clear out the sky, and one Venom survives, and wait a second, I, le what? I legitimately did not know that the Prodigy can now grab air units, that is not something I remember seeing before and what was that even every single Venom commits into the attack but Master Leaf went for disc mechas and he just blasts them out of the sky and that is the result of harvester kill after harvester kill a phenomenal opening for Master Leaf and it's one where Shock Trumpet needs to rise to the occasion in game number two and that takes us to Tiberium Rift for our second map in the top left hand corner, playing as the red marked of Cain. This is Shock Trepid. That last game, I feel like, was the first regular exit time we have seen in a match where a player is probably going to lose and then they just drop out, as if it was a practice game, as if it was a random scrim. They just drop out and go, all right, let's move on to the next one. Meanwhile, in the bottom right-hand corner, sticking with Traveler 59, this is Master Leaf. Marked of Kane versus Traveler 59. We got to see a little bit of it in that last game, but it felt like we didn't see a lot. Those Venoms, so much money was invested into them by Shock Trepid. The Tier 3, the upgrade, the production, and then they dive on that Prodigy and they just get annihilated. Three squads, two full squads, wow. Uh, two full squads of Awakened that were manually produced by Shock Trepid crossing the map. No fast leg descent opener for Master Leaf. Shock Trumpet gets his three bikes. I feel like we should now call this the Shock Trumpet opener, even though this has existed as an opener since, like, Kane's Wrath began. It actually used to be more common to go for this three bike opener, and then, I don't know, some, some point over the years, the Buggy Scout opener became the de facto. And it's like, now you don't really go for the three bike anyways, because it used to always be Nod players would open with three bikes. And then if you saw four or five bikes, you're like, oh, okay, they think they can actually get some damage done. But three bikes was sort of the normal. And then it was just like, I don't know, three bikes fell out of favor. And now Shock Trepid is kind of bringing it back. He's not going to find any damage with it here. He will lose one bike, double EMP whiff. That's a misclick by Shock Trepid. And because of that, he loses all of his awakened. Wow, Master Leaf opens up game number one and punches Shock Trepid right in the face. And now game, how is this Harvester so low? Oh, Shock Trepid is kind of falling to pieces. I mean, look, it's a best of nine. It's a long series. You can give away one game. But when your mistakes are like this, this is not how you want to be losing game one and game two. Game one just completely falling out of his control, out of his grasp. And then game two, losing all of those awakened, losing all of the bikes, and then you return, you return to your side of the map and you've got a harvester that's almost dead because of one seeker tank. This is not the feeling that you want from game two in a best of nine. 
Jacques Trepet moving his MCV to a little bit more of a favorable location. He's drafted his second War Factory, and he will go pretty big into the bike buggy. Descent Seeker is a pretty good combination versus bike buggy. We'll see. We'll see. All right. It is the one base. I was going to say no i seat. It's the one base tier three, which is normally supported by this i seat. That income right there keeps the five harvesters on your main field nicely humming away. And Shock Trumpet, he scouts the, the natural, and he goes, oh, it's a one base tier three. It's tripods or mechapedes or something, prodigy, who knows. Uh, what? Okay. This is an all-in. Uh, Master Leaf says I need a stasis. I need one portal, one war factory, and that is it. No expansion, all-in. And he sells off the nerve center as well. So if he got a lightning spike down, that is it for that nerve center. No more units from that tier two place. Instead, he's going to be using the Prodigy. He's going to be using every Traveler 59 trick in the book to land this plane. He is going into a tailspin, and let's see if he can make a miracle happen. I guess it's not a miracle, but it is going to have to be a pretty tough game that he will be fighting out. Master Leaf's income is basically going to be flatlining from this point forward. It is not going to keep climbing. The Prodigy taking a little bit of damage. The Engineer gets sniped. That's the first good thing. Area Mind Control is a huge miss there for Master Leaf. That's great. But there's going to be the blink forward, and the MCV will be packed up. That Awakened Squad going for the kill, but no, he gets the MCV, and now it has to be sold off, but it's not. No, but it is going to be fast enough. I thought it wasn't going to be fast enough, but he gets the sell. Master Leaf has it his way, one way or another. The Mechapedes roaming around, and Shock Trepid doesn't realize what kind of an all-in this is, but no buggies. No buggies on the front line, not like this. Not like this. EMP, a massive EMP, but it doesn't really matter because these mechapedes are just dancing their heart away. And look at this from Master Leaf. The all-in switch with Descent. The Raider buggy gets captured. Only one as the slow field comes in as well, separating reinforcements from their main base. And actually, Mechabeat's kind of walking into the slow field as well, but the Descents are here to finish the job. A tragic loss here in game number two. Overwhelming firepower from Master Leaf. Two harvesters explode, and the buggy comes to the front line as the GG comes out, and Master Leaf opens up the best of nine with a masterful 2-0 score. It is not the end of the road, but Shock Trepid did not want to start out like this. And even though he can lose two more games before it's match point, it feels like he has to start taking back control or the momentum will be wheeling him out of control down the road and off a cliff. And at the bottom of the cliff is not actually a bunch of sharp rocks. It's instead this terrifying walrus man. And that is where Shock Trepid is going if he doesn't get control, if he doesn't start taking some wins away from this guy in the top right-hand corner. This is Master Leaf. In the bottom left-hand corner, plain Mark Duquesne, plain red, this is Shock Trepid. This is not how I wanted this series to be opening up, but it just makes the eventual reverse sweep of Shock Trepid that much better. Master Leaf is the overdog for sure. And we are seeing that. Shock Trepid has been putting out some impressive games, but he needs to kick it into a whole different gear. He needs to rise up to a whole different level to be able to take down Master Leaf, who is playing so incredibly sharp, so incredibly well here in the lower bracket final. Master Leaf gets knocked down by Futurama, but he does not want to stay down here long, and he wants to get right back up there to the grand final to have his shot 
at the first prize and at being the winter champion. Master Leaf chooses Traveler 59, but he, once again, he is not playing a low and slow style. He is playing fast and aggressive, taking risks that, honestly, a lot of these players are not willing to take. He is going, I mean, that all in with Scrin, not, I can't even think of another player. I guess Bike Rush would do it because Bike Rush is a little bit crazy and he will do just about anything. But there is no other player in this competition who would go with an all, go for an all in with Scrin. They might go for an all-in with GDI or Nod. Probably going to be Nod or Mark of Cain. But not with Scrin. I don't know. It's not, I could not name another player who I would put any money on them all-inning with Scrin. Again, Bike Rush would do it just because it's crazy and because he pulls wins out of nowhere. But Bike Rush is not in this competition. And no one in the top eight would I have seen that game from but Master Leaf. Now we have what looks like an extremely normal game. You do have on Tiki Turmoil a short walk to your natural expansion, and that may be influencing Master Leaf's choice. The natural on Tib Rift, or even Tournament Rift, is so much further away. And Tiki Turmoil, it's just that short little walk. No descent openings either for Master Leaf. We saw that in some of the games in the upper bracket. He did some pretty good damage with descent openings on various maps, but not here. He's happy to wait for his natural before the disintegrators come out on the field. Natural expansion coming up from both players. Barracks and a couple of rocket squads as well for Shock Trumpet. Once again, Shock Trumpet's super slow to respond to this Seeker. This time the Seeker is not pursuing, so it's not that much of a problem. And the buggy goes in for the scout, for Shock Trepid, so he should see everything. Where's the stasis chamber? We don't have a stasis chamber yet. Master Leaf actually prioritized double refinery on his natural expansion over the stasis chamber. That is actually kind of surprising. Buggy is coming out. It might be a buggy scorp combination, but Shock Trepid, it feels like he needs a second war factory, but he doesn't know it yet. There's the stasis. Fast Legs is upgrading double, double engineer, triple engineer. Oh, okay. So he is going for the defensive turrets, which is a nice touch. You know, maybe a little bit over uh, overkill, but we'll see. And that's where Shock Trepid gets eyes on the massive descent army that is bearing down from the north. Master Leaf is going to call in the Buzzer Swarm support power. He's going to try and clear out EMP lands. It catches the Seeker. That's, of course, the only thing that can actually be EMP'd in this moment. And Tib Troopers, I love it. I love the choice of Tib Troopers. What a play by Shock Trepid. What a call to go for a unit that nobody dares build other than Shock Trepid, apparently. And Master Leaf will grab both of the... Actually, he'll grab every neutral, capturable structure on this map. Air Tower comes up. Tib Troopers clean house in the north, but the defense doesn't stop there because in the middle of the map comes the Seeker Tanks and the second wave of Descent. Master Leaf has taken the tip spike and he's going to go for the phase on those Seekers. Everything else gets cleaned up. And phased Seekers are actually kind of useless. They will go for the stealth, and obviously Master Leaf just wants to get these boys home safe. Or I guess hope that hope that Shock Trumpet forgets that they're there. I don't know what his plan is here. Prodigy? Let's see. How good are my prediction skills? Obviously not that hard of a prediction to make, but the Prodigy is out on the field. The Plasma Missile Battery gets added on. And whatever Master Leaf is doing, he is assuming Venoms, or Vertigos, are going to be a problem. One Harvester grabbed. Where are the buggies to hunt down those cultists? They need to be fast. They need... Oh, no, the Blink back. The Blink back and those Harvesters are as good as dead. The buggies were not fast on the uptake, and so the cultists got away. If those buggies had been able to dive on the cultists, the story would have been different, or it might have been different, but the buggies were wasting their time shooting those seekers. And once again, Masterly finding an inch 
so that he can turn it into a mile. Three very different games coming out from Master Leaf against Shock Trepid. And Shock Trepid, he's going to take a third. He's going to try and stabilize as this game goes late. He's going to have an Eradicator Hexapod to worry about. And this is a full load of Tiberium stolen away from the from the Shock Trepid side of the map. Master Leaf rolling Mechapedes through the middle of the map. He has been favoring Mechapedes over basically anything else late game more than any other player. And especially in this tournament. That could be partially because Mechapedes did have a bug previously existing in Kane's Wrath where they would sometimes crash the game. Obviously not super often because we've seen Mechapedes in lots and lots of games. Ooh, one Mechapede gets sniped. Bikes with Tib Core do manage to find a kill, but not a second. They don't get the second kill. It would have been killer if they had el eliminated one more of those Mechapedes and now Master Leaf going for the Blue Tiberium, but he's going to find it empty, either because he's already sent those three Harvesters in or because Shock Trumpet got there first. And I don't think it was the latter. I think it was the former. Once again, Descent's going to hit Assault, the main base of Shock Trepid, but this time he is ready and waiting. He's got Venoms, he's got Shredder turrets, and Shock Trepid needs to be so much more agile because Master Leaf is sitting on a decent bank and a decent advantage as he rolls into the next stage of this game with his Eradicator Hexapod already out on the map every unit that he can claim every unit that he can slow down the expansion of shock trepid is better for master leaf sheesh master leaf climbing up to 11k in the bank we would normally call him out for bad macro but honestly master leaf has won so many games in this event that it doesn't even feel like it matters if he has a little bit of bad macro in one of the games. MCV gets grabbed, but it looks like... Uh, where did the wormhole actually exit? Maybe he just sold off that MCV. That might have been what the Prodigy did. Either way, at the third base, the expansion is no more. Shock Trepid getting sewn up tighter and tighter in his body bag. Everywhere you look, Master Leaf is taking it to the next level, and Shock Trepid is not rising to the occasion. Shock Trepid can maybe find a way out of this, but it feels like it's going to have to start in game number four because these first three have been total control games by Master Leaf. Actually, I love this. If there were three times the infantry out on the field right now, I would be so on the side of Shock Trepid. If he had enlightened and more rockets and he was like really putting pressure on this Eradicator, well I guess it doesn't matter now because the phase fires off. Another uh, security blanket there for the screen player. One enlightened squad gets taken over. The Harvester doesn't actually die. Are you kidding me? It doesn't actually die. The Harvester survives. Double defensive tower in the middle of the map. I love the Venoms. Here to hunt Ravagers. Here to hunt Devastator Warships. You know, anything that they can get. Find and kill. Slow, super slow third base from Master Leaf, but it literally didn't matter. He was floating 11k in the bank earlier. The MCV has been rebuilt for Shock Trepid, but it feels like he's got training wheels on. He is not ready to go into the final race if this is how the game is going. Master Leaf hasn't finished it out yet, and every moment that goes by, Shock Trepid has another opportunity to get back in this game, but packs are out, Devastator Warships and Eradicator Hexapod, and Shock Trepid is just now reestablishing his third base. It's a consolation prize in this moment. A fantastic tournament run by Shock Trepid, and I so want to see him in the grand finals. But as more games go over to Master Leaf, it feels like the likelihood of Shock Trepid taking, you know, five in a row basically after this game 
is feeling slimmer and slimmer. Shock Trepid could depend on Master Leaf to make some really big errors and give this game away. With how well Master Leaf has been playing, it seems very unlikely. He's not even going to let the Tib Spike go down. Well, actually, he will. The, tib, the Eradicator couldn't get the angle on the Tib Spike, but Master Leaf will try and knock it down before the 50 seconds elapse for that Engineer to pay for itself. Unfortunately for Shock Trepid, he will not have any easy wins here, any easy kills. The stealth tank gets immediately shut down by two packs that are on overwatch of this field. They are just hovering over that field, ready for anything and everything that tries to harass these harvesters. And then on top of that, i Seed amping up this field, extending out its life even further. And as we say that, well, Shock Trepid has a bit of a bank now. He's actually got harvesters working away full time. He has got enough refineries here that he actually can have a reasonable amount of income. Some of this might actually be blue Tiberium. He might be uh, stealing some blue Tiberium or it might just be green from this Tib Spike that got eliminated. Is that a decoy harvester? That might be a decoy army harvester. Oh, okay. Well, our first one click, it feels like, from Shock Trepid. Did he? I don't think he had one in game one or game two. That might be literally his first one click in this entire series. Harvester just rolling through the middle of the map. All of these traveler units like, ah, oh, what are you doing? What exactly is your plan here? But no, Harvester goes down. Drone ship gets deployed and Masterly presses forward his front line inch by inch, but... Well, the first step was really a mile. Enlightened are here. Packs are not unopposed because we have some SAM sites, we have Tibcore, and we have Venoms. But the packs are only part of the problem. EMP locking down the Storm Column is actually a fantastic first step. I would love a cross-map situation. I would love a counter-attack somewhere over here. There is a cultist there ready and waiting, so it couldn't just be one random stealth tank sneaking in and finding a kill. Storm Column is here. EMP locks down the Eradicator once again, but there is just no army on the front line to do any damage. There's a bit of an infantry horde waiting behind the front defenses, and it's going to have to be a pretty amazing set of moves here from Shock Trepid. He rushes forward. Corruptors do their damage. Buzzer Hive is here as well. And as the forces of Nod thin out, there's just lots of Skrin left over. Corruptors are on the front line, the EMP lands, but it just doesn't matter. Master Leaf opens up with a 3-0 score, one after the other without making any major mistakes, and it just looks like his series. Shock Trepid needs to seriously change his strat in game number four. And so we go to another Tiberium Wars favorite tournament arena for game number four is the yellow, Traveler 59. This is Master Leaf. Meanwhile, in the bottom right-hand corner, is he going for a Shadow Team rush? Master Leaf thinks he is. This is Shock Trepid. It's a small map, and Shadow Team rushes can work on it, but it appears the answer is no. Marked of Cain versus Traveler 59 has not worked out well for Shock Trepid thus far. Master Leaf spending a little bit of extra cash early on is, well, as good of an advantage at this stage of the game that Shock Trepid could ask for. Master Leaf didn't, like, misplace his first refinery or something, which uh, would be pretty funny to see, but that is not something that we are going to see in this, well, I shouldn't say in this tournament, but I think we will uh, not see any misplaced refineries in this tournament. And so Shock Trepid kind of gets a little bit of an edge there over Master Leaf, at least in mentality. Once again, this is a Tib Wars map. 
Shock Trepid is going to be super familiar with it from that place, but obviously Kane's Wrath is a different game. No blue tip really at the start. Decrepit Arena has a pretty decent amount of blue Tiberium right at the start of the game, and we've seen some players try to use that to their advantage. Tournament Arena, though, no blue at the start, and so I think it's going to be playing out a little bit more how we normally see Tournament Arena play out. Shock Trepid, will it be the second War Factory? Well, he is going for more and more Harvesters. He is not switching it up into a big bike buggy pressure force, and indeed, he's just going for the Scout. So this could be a refinery into just a normal kind of high economy macro game. Nerve Center for Master Leaf. His MCV is positioned, telegraphing that he wants to go for an expansion. But the reality is the nerve center and the portal are telling a different story. Even the harvester transitioning down to the blue Tiberia master leaf is trying for the smallest fake out in the world. His seeker tank pushing that front line further, a little bit further forward. And the stasis chamber is now out. Buggies from Shock Trepid will scout and see, confirming that the natural expansion is not only nowhere in sight, but as the vision recedes, Shock Trepid will confirm that the natural expansion is later and later and later, and that is where the alarm bells start ringing. That is where things start to make a little bit more sense. And if this is another one of those MCV cells, does he go tier three and then MCV cell again? Kind of like he did on Tiberium Rift. That would be a pretty funny move. He does it. Master Leaf says I can do it twice in one series. This map, a lot smaller, a lot tighter. I theorize that maybe Master Leaf was trying to exploit the long distance between the main and the natural on that map, but he's doing it again here. The first beam cannon is now out for Shock Trepid. His front line is bikes, is buggies, excuse me, and a hand of Nod. The, the lightning spike goes down and the first set of Seeker Tanks is getting pushed back, but he doesn't want to give away too many of those buggies. He's going to need them to run down that Prodigy. He's going to need them to run down those Cultists. And I love the double, triple Tib Trooper on the front line, slowing down those vehicles, slowing down those Master Leaf units, but also giving him the ability to stop any big punch of disintegrators. Temporal Wormhole will slow down that MCV, and here comes the Prodigy. I feel like I can feel it. There's the blink forward, the area mind control on the MCV, and he almost burns down his own MCV, but Master Leaf will get the capture and the sail. Master Leaf sells off the MCV of Shock Trap at a secondary cash boost for the Traveler 59 player. And actually, I lost control. I lost track of that prodigy in all of the chaos. It's made its where it's made its way somewhere else on the map. I'm sure. Mecha beats falling one by one. Can another one get eliminated? These rocket squads are falling thin, but the beam cannons are finding their damage. No MCV means no base push, but it means no tier three for Master Leaf. Shock Trepid needs a big win here, and he needs to start putting points on the board. And boy, oh boy, does he have a shot at doing that. Another Mecha Pete falls, and a third will be eliminated. These beam cannons are getting the win for Shock Trepid. He pushes in Master Leaf down the hill and the GG comes out. The cliff has now been the reverse and Master Leaf loses his first game in the loser bracket final. Shock Trepid keeps his hope alive in game number four. His first point on the board. It will not be a clean sweep and he has a little bit of momentum going into game number five. And that will take us to tournament decision for map number five. The hills and mountains of this map will be the battleground for the man in red. Putting a point on the board, keeping his hope alive. This is Shock Trepid. 
Meanwhile, looking to regain control, playing yellow, playing Traveler 59. Give a cheer for Masterleaf. Shock Trepid reinvigorated with that win on Tournament Arena. Masterleaf tries the all in, but doesn't find success. And now that we are on a map with a very big starting field, what does Masterleaf, who has been mostly the one setting the pace and the tone of these games, what does he decide to go for? In a lot of these games, Shock Trepid has been playing catch up. He has been playing very reactionary and trying to understand and react to what Masterleaf has been doing. And for now, all right, double refinery. Everything's looking nice and normal. Okay, that is actually not normal, but it's not that insane depending on where this MCV goes. MCV repositions a little bit. Shock Trepid also wants a slightly different MCV position. Okay, they're just they're just going for different refineries. You want that third refinery to be nice and far away from your starting two refineries in case there are any chemical missiles, any catalyst missiles that find their way to your front door. Two tip spikes, and both of these players have fast legs, uh, potentially at their disposal a little bit later on in the game. It's the same upgrade, but it's advanced articulators and cybernetic legs. But, you know, we're talking about the same sort of thing from these two players. Operation Center is out for Shock Trepid, the first deviation. And hey, MCB gets locked down. Always love to see it. Never a big deal, but always just a nice little uh, tilter there for your opponent. Nerve Center, I think, does get scouted by Shock Trepid. And it looks like his timings are maybe just a little bit slow by comparison to Master Leaf. Secret Tank and a Lightning Spike. A little bit of pressure coming in from Master Leaf, and the EMP will land on the Lightning Spike, but not the Secret Tank. Knocking that offline for a couple of seconds is a nice addition to this defense. Pulls the Harvester back. Well done by Shock Trepid. He is, one again, he is gonna wanna keep a close eye on exactly what Master Leaf is doing because apparently Master Leaf is doing sneaky stuff like explorers into the corner of the map. Master Leaf is just going for an actual expansion behind this. He's also putting a lot of pressure on this Harvester. That EMP saved that Harvester barely, keeping it alive. And Master Leaf is now going to be able to take shots at this next Harvester. It's one base tech for both players. Secret Tank's going to be trying to dive a little bit deeper. The repair so critical here for Shock Trepid. I cannot believe it, but he does it. He keeps his Harvester's alive. He manages to get enough cash in the bank, and here we go. Catalyst Missile finds a couple of Harvesters to do a touch of damage to, right as the Icor Seed lands as well, and the Stasis Chamber is actually going to get constructed at the natural expansion and not in the main. Masterly, taking kind of an early natural, but of course... The Explorer's there early. There are no refineries here because he doesn't need them right this moment. He might place one soon, but he doesn't need to prioritize that refinery at the natural. Seed Tiberium lands for Shock Trepid as well. Matches the Icor Seed of the Scrin player. And Shock Trepid has to be so, so careful about the Prodigy and the Cultists as we step into these later parts of the game. Is the Prodigy already out? Because he's not constructing one, so that's a little bit of a surprise. Mechapedes are here, and this is just like a couple of Mechapedes that are thinning out the herd, taking the numbers down, making sure... Ah, there we go. Making sure that the units on defense are not too much. No stealth. MCB unguarded. 
Never learn, and that's another MCV down, caught, and killed. Storm Column deployed as well, and the Prodigy will wait in. That is a rough game to go out on, but Shock Trepid takes another loss. The momentum from Tournament Arena evaporating here in game number five as we move to game six and match point for Master League. And back to Atacama Road for the next match. No more mistakes. An incredibly tall task is before the red marked of Kane player in the north. Give a cheer. Give your energy to Shock Trepid. And in the south, showing domination. Game after game. Sharp timings. Great strats. And aggressive play. This is Master Leaf. Master Leaf has been showing incredible games all throughout this tournament. Domination has been one of the words I've used quite a lot for Master Leaf. And then it came to Futurama, and he just didn't have what it took. Naturally, that was a 4-3 best of seven. It went the distance, but it's not like this. Dune Tiger got 3 0'd. Master Leaf dropped someone else quite quickly as well. And most of these games, Shock Trepid has been getting outplayed. He's been putting up a good fight in some of them, but across the board, those prodigies have been his downfall. He just does not have a good sense of where they are. His Venoms are always a little bit too late. His Disruption Towers don't come in. And the Secret Tanks are now here to guard against these three bikes. Maybe the bikes can get some damage on the Tib Spikes. If they swing around to the other side of the map, that would be nice for Shock Trepid. Double Refinery, single War Factory so far for Shock Trepid. It's Atacama Road. It's a pretty short walk to your natural expansion, but you do have to cross over your own main field, and then you do get the beautiful purifying pool in the middle of the map with the blue Tiberium around it. So we'll see who can sneak into the middle of the map to grab that Tiberium. No free shots on this drone ship. No lucky damage for Shock Trepid as his attack bikes have been sharking around the map. Two awakened squads making their way down the right side of the map. And the attack bikes and buggies will be scouted by one buzzer. Master Leaf himself is going to have some units in his base, taking a look at exactly what is going on. It felt like we saw some fire and some fury in Shock Trepid versus Drive versus Phoenix but it just has evaporated versus Master Leaf. We're not seeing those games that he was able to pull off versus those other players. And now he has to play essentially perfectly for the next four games in a row, starting with this one here on Atacama Road. His belief is that Bike Buggy is going to be what does it. Third Refinery is up for both players. It's gonna be Descent's Fast Legs not on the way yet, or not here yet, but it is on the way as the Stasis is here. Buzzer Swarm gets dropped down. First EMP lands, takes that Buzzer Hive offline as well because Master Leaf was overextended on his electrical grid. Bike Buggy backs off. Shock Trepid pokes and prods, finds nothing, gets nothing. Descent Seeker is a powerful unit composition. And Bike Buggy generally fails to deal with it. Buggy, buggy Scorpion may be a little bit better of a track record, but actually, Hand of Nod... Do we see the secret shrine as well? We do, okay. 
Shrock Trepet has found maybe an answer. Is it going to be too late? The first wave of damage is looking pretty thin. There's not a lot on the ground here for Masterly. But this is only the first wave. The second wave is a little bit further to the east. Shredder turrets take down the descent bike. Buggy commits into the attack, and Master Leaf is going to be forced to back off. He's waiting for a more opportune moment. Buzzer Swarm support power, it looks like, got called in. Clears out the Awakened so that another front can be opened up in the west. Refineries are going unharassed. Shock Trepid is once again on the back foot, playing defensive, playing reaction. How well can you react to Master Leaf? Most players not well enough. And Shock Trepid will see what he is able to pull out here with his back against the wall. Sometimes that's where players come alive is when the chips are down. They need to be behind in the score before they finally will come forward and show their best games. But on the right side, this expedition force has been caught. It won't be killed. Phase will save it. And the cultists on the left side will find one awakened squad before they get eliminated. And that is not the win that you want for those cultists. Buzzer hives are here. Another outpost for Master Leaf. Two games in a row. It wasn't a misclick. He genuinely believes in outposts, at least in these two games. Master Leaf, I think, heading to the middle of the map for that blue Tiberium phase, roaming around in the main, in the natural. We'll try and keep an eye on that MCV because I have no doubt that there is a prodigy roaming the map somewhere. There it is. Tier 3 will be the target. There we go. Sell off there and blink away. Tib Troopers slowing down those units one by one, and the bikes and the buggies give up the attack and the tripods get teleported in. There is finally a second MCV, so one MCV going down won't be the end of the world for Shock Trap and another Harvester surviving with just a smidge of health, barely anything at all, but power plants getting targeted down, and I love the disruption towers finally online, making those attacks take a couple of moments longer. One tripod gets teleported back, the other one might get smashed, Ken. If he gets the husk as well, that's just another win for Shock Trepid. He is finally here on Atacanama Road, feeling like his feet are underneath him. Master Leaf sold himself into the tournament arena loss. But here, Shock Trepid actually has a bit of control and a bit of a chance to take this game. Engineer is going to capture the husk. And that'll be a win for Shock Trumpet. Disruption Towers are here. Love to see them. Slow field as the bike buggy engages with these harvesters. But some of these are decoys just here to draw on the fire and distract these units. That slow field murdering this bike buggy against the tripods and the storm column. But at least one tripod returns to... Okay, those were just descents. Returns to Shock Trepid. Second Disruption Tower is here, buying some precious time for Shock Trepid as his MCV sets up at the third. He's hoping for this game to go a little bit longer and a little bit later into the gameplay than some of our earlier matches where it's five, six minutes and then the GG comes out. Tripods are here. Eradicator Hexapod is 50% of the way done. Third bases are a little bit slow on the uptake. Only one refinery for Master Leaf and none so far for Shock Trepid. That Shredder turret, the early warning system. I would love to see another disruption tower or two get placed down. Refinery is online. Tripods will need to be met in the field of battle. Stealth on these harvesters is a huge benefit. And these tripods almost killing the harvesters but not quite finding the kill the prodigy is gonna need to blink to escape but no master leaf is making clear mistakes here unforced errors as shock trumpet finds a win by killing that prodigy if only he could snipe the stasis chamber as well but the prodigy hasn't started the rebuilding process yet engineers coming out shock trumpet is starting to believe in himself he still has a long road to go, but stopping this Eradicator would be the next step in the right direction for Tib Spikes to none. 
as Shock Trepid finds two tiny advantages to start the snowball rolling in his direction. His third base getting added on in a respectable timing, but Master Leaf is not ready to give this one up yet. The Prodigy has probably re-emerged one place or another. There are so many portals out on this map, and always you have to be vigilant when watching for that Prodigy when waiting for Master Leaf to make a mistake with the Prodigy. Cultists out to the front line. Eradicator Hexapod is on the front line. Tibcore missiles have been purchased. And they're gonna try and sneak by. Maybe they'll be able to find some damage. The tier three could potentially be exposed or maybe it's just gonna be harvester killing season. But finally, Shock Trepid steps out onto the other side of the map. Venoms are gonna be going hunting for some cultists. They're gonna find at least one squad, but then that might be the end of the Venoms for this game. Harvester's going down. One of the bikes goes up to the heroic status and the front line is going to be moved forward by Master Leaf. He's gonna be pressuring the main base of Shock Trepid, but Shock Trepid is gonna be pressuring the main base of Master Leaf. And the Tib Core will rock down that War Factory so quickly, but the exit is gonna have to be just as quick for Shock Trap at the EMP, locks down that Eradicator, and this tripod doing big damage with the help of these Enlightened. The EMP's locking down, but the phase fires off in just a moment's notice, and there, Master Leaf gets a free minute to spare. The Eradicator is safe. The tripod will retreat, and the front line of Shock Trepid is now going to become his natural expansion. Another Venom emerges, and at least the Eradicator Hexapod can't do any damage, but he would have so much more liked to have gotten the kill there. The Redeemer is now out on the field. The third base is being assaulted. And as the front line moves closer to the main base and to the natural expansion of Shock Trepid, the Prodigy is going to do nothing. I thought he was going to blink forward and grab the War Factory, but not at the current moment. Finally, the Eradicator does go down, but the cost may be too much. The Venom commits in. The Corruptor gets the save on that Prodigy. And at the same time, the third base has fallen. Shock Trepid getting pressure on two fronts at once. Master, Master Leaf is starting to comb through every chance that Shock Trepid has at the comeback and delete the entry from the database. Master Leaf presses forward the rage gen two minutes ago would have been phenomenal, but here there's just too many targets to shoot at. The MCV will go down. The tripod's keeping the front line moving forward. Two sides are where Shock Trepid is losing, and the GG comes out. Master Leaf will reclaim his spot in the grand finals. He'll get his rematch with Futurama, and he is revved up and ready to go. And for the last time in the Winter Championship, two tournament odyssey for game one of the grand final best of 13, the double elimination finisher for this tournament and this event in the North. Coming back for a second shot, his chance at revenge, the yellow Traveler 59. This is Master Leaf. And in the south, playing the Cyan, also playing Traveler 59. This is Futurama. Master Leaf versus Futurama. We've already seen it once, and now we get the rematch. Of course, played on different days. This was actually played on the 8th of January or thereabouts, so all the way here in 2023, the finals, the grand finals were played, and it will all conclude with this final best of 13. And no, the scoreboard is not wrong. Futurama, as the winner's bracket winner, does carry a one-point advantage into this series. And when it's a long one like best of 13, that one point can come in Clutch, but we will see how this one turns out because Master Leaf was looking in total domination mode versus Shock Trepid. And when it's a close series, and then one of the players in the rematch 
kicks it up to the next level. Well, it might be Master Leaf's turn to take the win away from Futurama. Tournament Odyssey, a fantastic battleground for our first game to start on. Something that both of these players are going to be very familiar with. It's been in the pool for a number of years now. And everybody kind of agrees that it's a pretty solid map, even if it's not their favorite map. Everyone has lots of games on it, lots of experience with how this one plays out. Short walk to your natural expansion, pretty easy to secure these two bases. But the third base is the question mark on this map. Not only where do you go, but as soon as you move to the third, it leaves either your main or your natural super exposed, depending on which direction you move. Buzzers coming in for the scout from both players. Natural expansion refineries getting dropped. The timing very similar. Both players wanting to play this out at least to the mid game. Macro oriented openers, but not necessarily super eco games so far from Master Leaf and Futurama. And that brings me to a big, big thanks to Rotter Milan for donating the $1,000 prize pool for this event and to Bike Rush Owns for hosting and organizing this event as well. $300 goes to first place, $185 goes to second, $105 to third place, $75 to fourth, $50 to fifth, $35 to sixth, uh, and then 30, 25, and 20 to seven, eight, and nine. So a lot of payouts here in this bracket, but of course, a little bit weighted towards the top end, but honestly not, not that heavy of a distribution for first place. It's, uh, it's quite a flat distribution in total. It's not like, you know, $700 of the thousand goes to first place. So this is something that even if you don't take first, you can still get a little bit of a payday for playing Kane's Wrath in the year 2022, which is always great to see people jumping in, getting involved. And well, it looks like we have another prodigy potentially on the way. We'll see. It could just be cultists for the current moment as the Gunwalkers aim to put a little bit of pressure on the natural expansion. The descents go to the high ground and are hoping to maybe swing in for the backstab. We'll see if the cultists know it is going to be Ravagers, but the tier three is down, so the Prodigy is also on the menu. Whether or not it'll actually come out to play is anyone's guess, but given Master Leaf's track record, it's a pretty safe bet. The Crane is kind of on the front line. It is a little bit exposed here. It is kind of out in the open, and it will be one Gunwalker guarding this Tib Spike, but it will get eaten up. And now there is a little bit of an opportunity for Futurama to create some chaos. Buzzer Hives at the front will be trying to distract as the Gunwalker gets eaten up at the natural expansion and one Harvester may go down, but the Buzzer Hives are going to make sure that only one goes down. The Ravagers coming in for the snipe on the rest of these units. Mechapete's going to be the follow-up and it will be Gunwalker battles, but this is not a fight that you can win with pure Gunwalkers if you're Futurama. The Warp Chasm is here. He sees the timing of it and he knows where he is in relation to it. Killing the Tib Spike is a nice touch. Keeping his own Tib Spikes around is good, but missing out on those Mechapedes is going to be difficult for Futurama. <laughs> his Cultist does survive, albeit barely, as the Gunwalkers go for each other in the middle of the map. Temporal Wormhole slowing down some of the reinforcements for Master Leaf and more cultists coming through. They're not capping Gunwalkers. They're just turning and running. Lightning Spike gets deployed. A defensive Lightning Spike for Futurama as he gets his own Mechapedes. His own Warp Chasm slow to the battlefield. Nowhere in sight as Ravagers take down one Harvester and dodge on out that Tiberium Agitation coming out once again in the Winter Championship as Master Leaf retreats from the front line looking to his Eradicator and possibly his Prodigy to secure him the next stage of this game. Harvester Snipes are hard to stop when it's Ravagers coming in for the kill. And it will be Ravagers that find that kill. 
Ooh, the Buzzer Swarm was expecting the Ravagers to go a little bit further to the left and to hang out over there. The Prodigy is here for Futurama. The Cultists are here as well, but it, there's only the Eradicator Hexapod out on the field. And now the Prodigy going to be moving in with the help of these Mechapedes. But the Prodigy turns tail and runs. It's going to be Mechapedes versus Mechapedes. And of course, the Eradicator Hexapod for Master Leaf is unmatched in this, our modern time in this game. Futurama doesn't have an answer for that epic unit. Meanwhile, another Harvester going down. More buzzers are the response for Master Leaf. And his only hope, Futurama's only hope of stopping this game seems to be the Cultists. And he's letting them die, sitting here, just running them into the enemy front line. Futurama falling asleep as he shows up to game one of the grand final. His drone ship has deployed at the third as his natural continues to be assaulted. He has to get ravagers of his own to try and clean up Master Leaf's units. And finally, he will get the kill on the ravagers of Master Leaf and be able to clear out that defense, clear out that offense that Master Leaf has been putting forward. Cultists sent in mass to their grave by Futurama, a critical mistake at a juncture where he was already behind in the army and now he loses all of those cultists and he gives Master Leaf an opportunity to get even further ahead. If he could deny the third, first cultist down, Master Leaf trying to escape. One cultist might be able to skate on out of here. The Mechapede goes down, so that's minus three mechas for Futurama and suddenly his third base looks like it has no place to go but down. Area Mind Control comes in, the buzzers camping outside of that barracks and the Prodigy will not be able to save Futurama this time. No slick plays to try and come back out into this game as the cultists get gunned down and there's just too many mechapedes for Futurama. His drone ship down to half health. His cultists running amok, trying to cause some problems, but ultimately getting very little done. And Master Leaf regains control of this game, regains control of this series as he is about to tie up the score one to one, unless Futurama can make something miraculous happen in the last moments. If these cultists start turning these mechapedes around, that just adds insult to injury. Prodigy gets this forced cell of that drone ship and will be able to escape. The Mechapedes going to be doing battle with each other. Cultists making sure that the win is always on the side of Master Leaf. But finally, there's enough Cultists here for Futurama to turn this around. One or two of these Mechapedes could be absolutely crucial for Futurama. Ravagers come in and masterly pulling the rest of the Mechapedes further and further away, trying to maintain his dominance over these Mechapedes with the use of his own Cultists. Buzzer Swarm support power gets called in. The Cultists of Master Leaf dodging and weaving. The Mechapedes stay on the side of Master Leaf, and the Cultists need to start winning these Mind Wars as Futurama is hoping to keep something alive against everything that Master Leaf has, but it's just not working. Mechapede after Mechapede in the employ of Master Leaf turns this game into his first win, his first start of the comeback from the lower bracket. He dropped down there briefly, but he is looking for blood, and Futurama is the next speed bump in his road to victory. Futurama came through in the winner's bracket final 4-3. It was no easy task, and it's not going to be any easier here in the grand final. And game two will send us to airport escape for the next shot at the momentum swing. Who will be the first player to truly take momentum in this series to have a map score that is indicated by wins in the North? The man who's feeling pretty good after that game number one as Traveler 59, this is Master Leaf. And if you believe what your opponent is doing is OP, then you might as well go for the same thing yourself. Playing Traveler 59 in the south, going for the same stasis descent opening. This is Futurama. Game number one nearly got turned around, but he never quite managed to win the Cultist Wars. A couple of key mistakes there leading to the victory 
of Masterleaf. And all credit to Masterleaf. He played that out very well. Smart, sharp play. But Futurama also made a couple of mistakes, which tipped the scales into the favor of Masterleaf. Here, Futurama actually gets a really good engagement that he, uh, he probably should not have been able to do as much damage in it as he did, but he got a good start of that engagement, a good angle, catching those couple of stray squads, and he did get some value for his descents, even though he was at lower numbers. This is one of those maps where you do start with some blue Tiberium, and Masterleaf says it's going to be easier to defend the green field when I go for this kind of an opening, and we'll see if he's right, because right now Futurama is getting double the Tiberium, but it is, he does have to drive quite a ways further to get that Tiberium. First Gunwalker is out. Double Harvester out for Masterleaf. So their income is actually pretty close to the same. Masterleaf might actually be a little bit ahead. The Double Harvester plus the faster refining times might be leading to an advantage. And when you go for these Descent Openers, you just don't have the cash on hand to go for the Crane to do the Double Refinery Base Crawl over to that Blue Tiberium. And if you're thinking this looks a little bit like Pipeline Problems, well, you are correct. It is a bit of a twist on Pipeline Problems. It has the same encased Blue Tiberium field, which is very close to you. And oftentimes we do see crane openers on this map as well. You've got the defensive towers. They're just placed a little bit differently. And then the tib spikes, which are over here on the high ground instead of both on the right side. One Harvester down. Finally, Futurama comes alive, finds some damage, and he will get himself two out of the three Harvesters that are on the front line for Masterleaf. And now, the economic advantage. The GG gets called, and Masterleaf has been defeated. Futurama finds the kills, and Masterleaf asleep at the wheel i don't know that was just a complete unscouted attack they killed the tip spike they transitioned down and master leaf just wasn't ready for it for whatever reason he made a mistake in his judgment thinking that those descents were not going to come for his main harvesters he had the buzzer hive ready but it just wasn't enough and suddenly two harvesters down against a blue tiberium player and that is that Master Leaf decides his best shot is to move on to game number three. And that'll send us to Tournament Crater for game number three. The momentum has been taken. The score becomes two to one for this man in the north, playing the Cyan, playing Traveler 59. This is Futurama. And in the south, playing yellow. Looking for his shot at revenge. This is Masterleaf. Playing Marked of Kane, switching it up after two Traveler mirrors. He says, no, I think Marked of Kane is the way to go. EMP Control Center gets grabbed by Futurama quite immediately. Tib Spikes grabbed by both players, but it looks like Futurama's engineer is a little bit late to the second one. There we go. He does remember to grab it, but does he remember to grab the second one? Okay, yes, he does send it back. Does move the engineer in the correct direction. Nicely done. Futurama has had a pretty crazy 2022. If you guys did not know, Futurama is Ukrainian, so obviously 2022 has been a tougher year for him than it has for most of us. And as a result, his entire life has been upended, turned on its head. And from my understanding, he no longer resides in Ukraine. He was forced to flee his home. And Masterleaf has been maybe not under the same kind of duress, but he has been going through his own processes. Wow, I'm not trying to compare these two things. I just realized it kind of sounds like I'm trying to equalize these two things, but I'm not. I'm just saying Masterleaf has been taking a break from competitive play for a good long while and has come back into this tournament, gets his shot at the grand finals, misses it in the upper bracket, and then immediately rockets back, drops like, what, one game to shock trep it, and then rockets back into the grand finals. His first big tournament appearance in several years. I guess he did play in some team tournaments 
last year. But again, not trying to compare the two, just trying to update those of you who are a little bit less familiar with the Kane's Wrath scene. What has the last year looked like for these guys? It's been a very different year for some of us than it has been for others. Buggy comes in for the scout for Futurama. Bike Buggy will be the choice for Master Leaf. He himself gets scouted a little bit there by Futurama. And we do have to keep our eye on this EMP control center as the bikes and the buggies move in up to the north side of the map. They're going to be looking for a blue Tiberium harvester that just isn't there. Futurama not sending a harvester over to the blue Tiberium really, really quick. Buggies do get caught and separated. These descents don't jump on them, though, so that actually could have been a kill on that buggy. Both of those buggies could have gone down. Futurama kind of losing out in that moment. Bike's going to be swinging around onto the natural expansion. This is going to be a, gay, a game where the aggression gets underway very quickly. Master Leaf looking to transition out of it, though. He wants to put on a bit of pressure, keep up some damage, and then uh, barrel out of this with his economy leading the way. Photon Cannon gets deployed. Master Leaf will back off. Basically, no damage done. I do like that, you know, or one thing that you have to keep in mind with the EMP is that when the units are as fast as bikes and buggies, you really have to be predictive with where you think they're going to be. And when they hear that EMP sound, they may very well change their course. Bike's going to be splitting off. Another Seeker tank going down. Seeker Descent is a super strong combination. We've already seen it have great effect against Marked of Kane players in the past. Mass Buggy coming out here for Master Leaf. He might need a couple of uh, Scorpion tanks in here as well, but it is going to be an extra War Factory. EMP fires off, misses basically everything, tags one Buggy, and it's going to be up to the Seekers and up to the Descents to clear out the rest of these Buggies. And, well, the Lightning Spike is going to help win this fight for Futurama. Reinforcements coming in from Master Leaf, and he's got a secondary group of attack bikes on the north side of the map looking for a bit of damage here or there. Futurama falls to the reinforcements of Master Leaf, and the bikes don't find any damage on the north side of the map. Futurama manages to hold the defense while losing on the offense. And Master Leaf might have a little bit of a backstab headed his way in a moment. Descents and some Seekers going to be going down the right side of the map looking for that bit of damage. Nerve Center is, of course, out, but the Tier 3 is also out for Futurama. He's got his economy rolling. He's got his tech rolling as well. Slow field on the bikes. Going to be giving Futurama extra time to respond to this situation. A photon cannon could come out adding to this defense, but harvesters are going to go down. Three harvesters saved by the one click of the phase. Two more harvesters are vulnerable here on the front line, but at the same time, Master Leaf going to be losing his own harvesters. No, his Shredder turrets are here in good numbers, and at the same time, his main base is being defended as well. Action exploding everywhere on the map as the bikes are going to exit from the natural expansion of Futurama. And Futurama still desperately looking for any damage that he can find anywhere on this map. It's a tier three Master Leaf as well. The double war factory on the low ground pumping out so much bike buggy that he's going to be able to overwhelm Futurama. And that will do it for this attack. Nice try but you're going to have to do better next time. It'll come down to the Mechapedes, and it might be coming down to the Prodigy and the Cultists as well. No Cultists so far, just more Descents. The Prodigy can potentially move across the map, get a money capture on that MCV, and that Catalyst Missile may have actually seen and ID'd the Prodigy. Whatever Master Leaf used to get vision for that Catalyst Missile may have actually seen the Prodigy as well, and Master Leaf is now going to be aware, An Air Tower is probably on the way. Venoms and Supercharged Particle Beams are on the menu for Master Leaf. If he can shut down that Prodigy, if he can slow down this Traveler 59 player, then he has a chance at just rolling his momentum from the mid game all the way into a win. 
And both players, as I say that, both players back completely off. The Prodigy stays home. Master Leaf recycles back to the middle of the map. And maybe he'll clean up the EMP control center. That might be the place to go. He's going to find a bunch of descents. Maybe more descents than he bargained for, but he has a lot of buggies. One Mechapede gets slammed, shut down immediately, and it will be an EMP that fires off and catches a number of these bikes. Six, seven bikes getting caught by this EMP, and there is going to be the Prodigy moving forward to the front line as well. He's going to get chased away immediately as the buggies swarm in and clear up the descent, saving their bike friends, but the transition has come. Master Leaf has his beam cannons already in production. We saw them on the field moments ago. The Prodigy goes down deep into enemy territory, spots the Warp Chasm as well. Master Leaf has all of the intel that he needs to take this game to the next level, and he's gonna dive on the Warp Chasm. He's gonna go for the kill. Photon Cannon is here, Tripod is here, Vapor Bomb is gonna go for the kill, and he denies that Eradicator, he denies the timing of Futurama, and he will get on out of dodge and head for the hills. A perfect kill by Master Leaf. One, two, punch, bought himself so much time, he doesn't need to take a third yet. He's still happy to play this one out a little bit longer on his natural expansion. It's a true two base play as the Redeemer Engineering Facility comes online. The EMP Control Center is sort of the only thing that Master Leaf is missing out in this game. Fortunately, the tripods were already on the map. Futurama found himself with like four or five tripods out on the map. It looks like it's just four before that warp chasm went down, so he does already have a decent tripod force. Any avatars or beam cannons can potentially be dealt with by these tripods. Buggy's going to be coming in. They will find some shock troopers, which is maybe not what they were expecting. Shock troopers aren't really in good enough numbers to quickly catch and kill these units. And it doesn't look like they have the plasma disc launcher. Oh no, they do have the disc launcher upgrade. So they've got both of their upgrades for the late game. And now the Redeemer is finally out on the battlefield. The Warp Chasm gets completely reset, and Master Leaf makes excellent use of that time. Secret Tank gets spotted. Futurama, he's going to be looking to take a third base. Master Leaf can play this one out for another minute or so on the bases that he's already got, but... Over the next two to three minutes, that Tiberium is going to expire. It's going to thin out. Back on the front lines. Catalyst Missile is probably also close to resetting in its time. It's already been used once, and it might be coming into effect again. Love to see Shock Troopers out on the field. Love to see them actually getting some action, getting their time in the sun. Scrin Infantry have had a pretty good showing. Tip Troopers have honestly had a pretty good showing as well. People have been using them quite well to lock down Scrin Infantry hordes. Descents, maybe even try and chase the Prodigy. And when you've got those fast legs as marked of Cain, it gives you the opportunity to actually run down those units and knock them out. Master Leaf wants to bring the fight to Futurama, but... Wait, where are the Beam Cannon army? I'm actually a little bit surprised that there isn't like 14 Beam Cannons behind this. He, ha he does have a Commando, he does have Supercharged Particle Beams, but the Commando is getting caught and killed. That was somewhat of a mistake there, a somewhat unceremonious defeat and beheading for that Commando. Area Mind Control takes down one Avatar, but just kidding because the Venoms get the kill and the EMP will fire off. It's gonna catch the Redeemer, not the Venoms. The Slow Field comes in and now it's Tripods to descend upon this Redeemer. It'll be the Tripods surrounding and destroying them as no Tib Core means these bikes are so much less effective and half of Master Leaf's army is just not participating in this fight. And Master Leaf suddenly finds himself without a front line. He finds himself without a front door to lock. He's instead going to be fighting this one out with a couple of avatars as the tripods encroach upon him. Those four or four, four or five tripods built early on by Futurama have come back to pay big, 
big dividends here in the late game. Blink forward, area mind control, the last three avatars get taken down, and Futurama will be coming, crushing through in game number three. He's found his victory on Tournament Crater, and he has found the win against Master League. Once again, Futurama starts out a little bit slow and gets his feet underneath him. Tripods, the unsung hero of the Skrin ground army, and the result is the Tripods come through clutch for Futurama and give him the win, but that economy was the backbone, never dropping behind in the eco. 22,000 credits of difference over the course of 10 minutes of this game. Let's jump into the next one. And Tiberium Rift will be our battlefield for game four of the grand finals. This best of 13 is going by quite quickly, especially when you start off with a one point lead in the north lane, the yellow GDI. This is Master Leaf. And in the south lane is the Cyan Black Hand. Give it up for Futurama. I don't want to watch any more Traveler 59 games where they hear you. They hear you, and now we get GDI versus Black Hand. I was a little bit afraid that it would be Traveler 59 Mirrors for like 13 games in a row, but it's not. We got some Marked of Gain. We're getting now a completely screen absent game. Get a little Black Hand action, a little regular GDI. Very traditional map setup as well. Maybe there will be some aggressive plays, but also this is a great big eco map where you can see big armies trading positions. We saw a fantastic map match between Phoenix and Green Zero in the quarterfinals. So yeah, this map, this matchup has led to some of the best games in Kane's Wrath's history. And this is, well, this might be another one of them. We have very macro-oriented openers for both players. Both of these guys seem like they are in good sorts, seem like they're in good shape heading into this competition. Master Leaf going to be pulling his MCV down to the south and Futurama heading up to the north. The first pit put bull is coming in for a bit of harassment. Futurama doesn't want to take too much damage on that Harvester, but of course he does have the Cabal being a little bit annoying on the other side of the map, seeing if he can do any damage, seeing if he can cause any problems for Master Leaf. And I mean, maybe this would be one of those things where if he had uh, rushed to his secret shrine, he could have actually done some damage, but then of course Master Leaf would have just produced an APC a little bit earlier, and cleaned up those Cabal squads so that the Black Disciples wouldn't do anything. Quarter HP off of that MCV. And it looks like Scorpion tanks are now out on the battlefield. At least one out here to protect these Harvesters. Master Leaf happy to play this one out with just a lot of Harvesters right out of the gate. Big eco orientation for both players as they get harvester after harvester after harvester. Very few attacking units as we head barreling towards the mid game on Tiberium Rift. Pretty good scouting from both players as well. There's been no tricks up their sleeve, but also they have been keeping good eyes on each other. Cabal, scout, Cabal squads scouting pretty consistently. Pitbulls scouting pretty consistently as well. Coming in, taking a look. And now we have our first refinery at the natural. Will it be a command post? Yes, it will from Master Leaf. The options of the airfield open up before him. And Futurama, well, it's going to be maybe something a little bit different. The refinery is the follow-up. The eco-focus for Futurama, and that is where having those cabals spread around the map becomes even more important. Oh, Rocket Squads don't get the shots off against the Pitbulls. He's going to be a little bit sad that he missed that opportunity, but it won't be the end of the world unless these six Pitbulls do manage to dive in and do some big damage against Harvesters. Cabal coming in. First airfield is here. Hammerheads as well. 
So many times we see Black Hand transition big into the infantry, and the Secret Shrine comes up for Futurama as Master Leaf gets his hammerheads, gets his AP ammo online, and now he's going to be able to transition into his natural expansion with a little bit of safety. His second War Factory is maybe more delayed than he would ordinarily like, but he is going to be able to have the safety of hammerheads, have the option of orcas. He might want to go firehawks as well. Vertigos have been a problem, but black hand, you don't have to worry about that. You just have to worry about that big man spam transition, them pulling out, I don't know, purifying flame or something. That is one thing is I don't know that we've seen Futurama do much with flame tanks at all this tournament. Uh, first hammerhead goes down right into the dumpster from the very beginning. Samsite placed very out in front and very much a preemptive move here. Both players trying to skim off of that blue Tiberium. I think Master Leaf ended up getting more of it than Futurama did. Hammerhead goes down. Third and fourth hammerheads show up to the battlefield. And the Pitbull is going to be trading against these attack bikes. But the hammerhead's getting a little bit too close for comfort. Last couple of rockets slam in. The hammerheads do survive, and it's mass rocket in the north. That SAM site just makes this base that much harder to crack. Refineries kind of placed far away for Master Leaf. They're not quite as close on the field as Futurama has them, and so his whole natural expansion will harvest a little bit faster than Master Leaf's. Maybe it won't be enough to make a difference. A big attack coming in here. Catalyst missile fires off, gets one refinery there on the left side, cuts down the economy, and Master Leaf now has more pressure to try and do some damage. He doesn't go for the upgraded power plant. He does go for the flyover on those rocket squads, clears them out, but as the bikes show up, these APCs don't have much support. It's bikes and rockets versus APCs. More APCs rolling up to the front line. It's a very slow parade push across the map. And as long as these bikes do survive, the APCs can never get comfortable in this position. No Preds, no Rockets, no extra firepower, no Orcas packed along for the punch. It is just an APC wall, and I'm not sure what Master Leaf is hoping to accomplish with this attack, but he has not found any damage. He has only found many losses here on the front line, and Futurama holds that attack no problem. Easy peasy. Every rocket gets wiped out, but he's already replenishing the infantry. His transition back into bio is going to be a swift one. Random Predator tank doesn't manage to find any damage, but also should be able to escape through the middle of the map. And Master Leap, he buys himself time to set up on his third. And this, as he transitions towards the Marv and the late game, is where Master Leap can finally take control of this game. No one had a distinct lead, and now Master Leaf has given away just a ton of value in units. So he really needs this third base to work out for him as Futurama goes for the double MCV. He goes for the double expand potentially, or rather the expand and the pressure at the same time. His third goes up, your third goes down. That is the story he wants to tell with the next minute or two of this game. Scouting buggies come out. They do get ganged up and dumpstered by those APCs, knocking down those buggies to make sure that nothing does come through. MCV is still slowly walking its way forward. It better deploy these APCs. They may not kill a building fast, but they will burn down a mobile MCV quite quickly. Charge particle beam has finished up. Bikes swing in, hammerheads swing out. Shredder turrets get annihilated, but the hub remains. And more SAM sites in the north. Futurama, he's now just behind in the times. His tier three and his epic unit are a little bit slower than Master Leaf's as he looks to take his third expansion slower than Master Leaf as well. That tier three is gonna add Tibcore missiles, I assume, to the roster, making the bikes that much more powerful and those SAM sites that much more powerful to knock down those hammerheads. All right, Reclamator Hub is on the way. Marv can clean up this field. Master Leaf has lots of cash in the bank. 
with more than 5K sitting in float. He has got a lot of units that he can crank out with the use of this third field. Well, we'll see if he's able to keep this third field safe. APCs can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these infantry, but it would be really helpful to have some watchtowers in the mix. And Juggernauts would be a nice addition as well. Second radar jamming missile fires off. Once again, Sonic Emitter is here better than a watchtower, at least sometimes. It only gets off one shot, which makes it worse than a watchtower in this instance. Obelisk goes down, and this Marv is taking so much damage uh, he's going to be forced to sell off the Reclamator hub as well. He loses it. The Obelisk is going to be able to pop those APCs one by one. And the Black Hand members leading these infantry squads are going to make sure that there is no frontline buildings that can survive. Harvester goes down. Futurama is keeping up the assault back up in the north. His own third is underway very nicely. He just turned that around. Walks in. Body slams the Marv with no engineers inside of it and no Reclamator hub to heal it. That Marv is basically a paperweight for the next two minutes. Futurama has a huge opportunity to just grow and grow with the use of his third in the north. Unassaulted, unstopped, and Futurama finds the hammerheads as well. He is about to go out of control, hampering the progress and the production of Master Leaf while he is going up to the next level. Only two juggernauts out on the field, and they're wasting their time shooting a Confessor Cabal instead of knocking it down that MCV. But the MCV gets sold off anyways. The main base will be wasted. Futurama is happy to pass one MCV along to the side of Master Leaf if it means that he gets the kills elsewhere. And clearing up the main base will become more and more useful the longer the game goes on, the more that Futurama is able to deny from that field. And it feels like Master Leaf is stabilizing. He's finally getting back on his feet. Sniper team's coming forward. A desperate need here for Master Leaf. And Futurama, with his Tibcor bikes, backs off and retreats. He is looking to fight around the Redeemer, and it will be the Redeemer that he hopes is his salvation. Futurama has massive punch potential. All of these bikes will evaporate in mere moments if they come up to a straight fight, but if they can all unload their rockets at once, they can do massive burst damage to the Marv, to Juggernauts, even to Mammoth Tanks, which currently don't have rail guns. So they are going to be fighting this fight, but they're going to be up against EMP Raider Buggies, they're going to be up against a Marv, and they're going to be up against Mass Confessor Cabal as well. There's not even a lot of rockets here. There are the rockets finally showing up to the fight. EMP Raider Buggies coming forward, Hammerheads getting cleared out. Juggernauts can be set upon by the EMPs or by the bikes. APCs on the north side, a couple of them getting distracted before this fight really breaks out. Both armies are spread so far out, spread so thin. Rage Gen might be firing off as the Raider Buggies come in. The Marv is separate out there is no support for this guy first raider buggy comes through emp lands shockwave artillery is the knockback the rng is good the orbital bombardment is going to be on top of that and it's going to be the hammerheads rolling in the mammoth tanks rolling in the money shots from the juggernauts as they find their mark and they knock down that redeemer the marv is so low on health the rockets show up but the juggernauts can't be stopped one more volley but no they don't get it the rockets roll forward and even go heroic as the Marv retreats. The last hope of Master Leaf. The EMP comes in and Master Leaf Army falls apart to the man spam of Black Hand. The rockets will find their target and that will be the end of the Marv. Master Leaf's late game GDI army never got rolling. The GG comes out and Futurama stomps his way to victory. He wasn't even looking to keep pushing after that. He was backing off to extend his lead, to keep denying, to keep pressuring. Neck and neck in economy, but that man spam transition was too powerful. Too many hammerheads going down and the APCs getting separated out away from the Marvs and the Juggernauts. The army falling to pieces 
in the last moments when it mattered most for Master Leaf. Let's jump into the next game. Back to tournament decision for the last time in this tournament. A wild ride, so many great games played on this map over the years and here in this event. In the north, trailing in the map score, but always ready to bring the pain. This is Master Leaf. And in the south, playing as the Cyan Traveler 59, it's another mirror matchup. This is Futurama. If he's able to knock this one down, coming from the upper bracket, he never lost a series. It might as well have been single elimination as far as Futurama is concerned. The hope remains alive. Traveler 59, that's one place where Master Leaf can find those victories. And Master Leaf's cultist play has been better than Futurama's. Probably for all time, but especially in this tournament as well. I think Master Leaf is just the better cultist player overall. And Futurama does have those moments where he falls down a little bit on his unit control. The rest of his play is so solid, but sometimes he does have those slip-ups as we all do, and it feels like Master Leaf has less of them when it comes to cultists. Descents down from the high ground. They're going to be walking right into Gunwalkers and Buzzers, so Master Leaf does decide to back on off. He realizes that he cannot take that, but he does have a sneaky engineer going for the northern tip spike of Futurama. I love that play by Master Leaf to go for the tip spike capture to take that away from Futurama. If Futurama didn't keep the portal around, no, he did not. So he is going to be losing that tip spike for a good long while. It'll definitely pay for itself and probably a lot more than that as Master Leaf sharks around looking for the final engagement. And he's not going to find much of an advantage with the double gunwalkers out, with the buzzer hive as well, powering down the refinery that's on the far side also, which does just force the harvesters close to the buzzer hive. Is there another Buzzer Hive queued? There is! Futurama has another Buzzer Hive queued as well. Harkening back a little bit to the way that you tend to play Red Alert 2 competitively, where you always keep a sentry gun or a pillbox queued up so that as soon as your opponent moves in with their tanks, you can drop the sentry gun like right in front of them as your tanks engage and their tanks will waste their time shooting that pillbox. And the same kind of thing is here. You keep that buzzer hive queued, and then as soon as the descents are close, you drop the buzzer hive in the middle of them, and you get the insta melee kill on half of those descents. That's the goal, at least. It didn't quite work out there, but it does scare away those descents. And a random buzzer approaching from the other side does find a couple of kills there for Futurama. The scouting is quite thorough from both players between the descent squads that Master Leaf has roaming around the map and the buzzers going through the base of Master Leaf for Futurama. They are keeping an eye on each other. The stasis chamber coming back into play for Futurama. He never got it initially. He never got those fast legs. And so now he is going to be adding that on so that he can match and mirror Master Leaf here in the game. Cultists could also be the choice for Futurama. We'll see. Fast legs are probably going to be the first option and cultists might be the choice after that. He does also get an engineer, so he will at least have that engineer out on the field so he can finally take back that tip spike. Master Leaf will clear out the southern edge of the map and this may actually give him the opportunity to sneak into that tip spike way down there as well. Engineer comes in. Futurama is going to make safe the path up to the high ground so he won't let that engineer walk into the fog. Sometimes people do walk their MCV or their engineer into the fog, and it ends up resulting in disaster for them. Pure descents, but the stasis chamber is still here. Big starting field means that you can play on one base for much longer than other maps. More descents coming on out. The reinforcements will be able to clean up Master Leaf's forces, and this attack will wash out to nothing. So Master Leaf does get the tip spike. He will deny both tip spikes just at different points in time from Futurama. 
And so once again, Master Leaf has three tip spikes to the one tip spike of Futurama. Big Gunwalker pressure coming in for Futurama. This didn't work on Tournament Odyssey for Futurama, but maybe Master Leaf will be able to get more done with his Gunwalkers. Shock Troopers also present in the south. Ah, building a couple of Shock Troopers, like to see it. Always nice to see those Shock Troopers once again get their day in the sun. I mean, the Ravagers, the Shock Troopers, I've been loving a lot of the infantry play in this tournament. Not every strategy has been my favorite from the Marked of Cain or the Traveler 59 players, but we have gotten to see infantry take more of the forefront in these games than many tournaments in the past. And that's always nice to see. Gunwalker is going to be trading out against these descents. Clear them up. Another engineer on the way for Futurama. And it will be a Gunwalker battle, but with repair drones on both sides. So Master Leaf is going to try and extend this out. He takes the defensive towers. He takes the EMP control center as well. Somewhat of a surprise to see him grab those neutral structures relatively early on. Area Mind Control comes in. That is one of the highest unit count area mind controls I think I have ever seen. Five Gunwalkers, and now suddenly the tide has turned. As soon as these turn back over to, to Master Leaf, he'll be able to get on out of there. But for the current moment, he's going to have to fight this one out with the help of his own Gunwalkers now returned to him. The Lightning Spike gets added on as well. Harvesters going to be taking a little bit of damage here or there and Futurama is going to have even more pressure to deal with cultists in the south for Master Leaf. Cultists I think out on the field as well for Futurama but the Eradicator Hexapod is almost here. It's just not here quite yet. Shock Troopers repositioning into the middle of the map. Gunwalkers haven't started gunning down that Tib Spike yet but the Shock Troopers are going to make the difference here. MCV on the move. Eradicator Hexapod is out on the map. Cultists don't find their mind control. Finally, they get it almost getting eliminated there. But finally, three Gunwalkers do get collected by Master Leaf. And the area mind control has got nothing on the proper mind control of a cultist or a prodigy. Blink forward as these shock troopers go down the cliff and look for the flank. They're maybe just a little bit late to the party, and as a result, they won't get anything really done. The Eradicator Hexapod worries not about such meager units such as the lowly Gunwalker. The Eradicator Hexapod is on the move. It's about a quarter of the way done for Master Leaf. Futurama moves closer to victory, but Master Leaf is so well set up in this game. EMP Control Center, faster to the natural expansion, just slower to the epic unit. And also, you know, forcing Futurama to recapture. Oh, Futurama loses his prodigy. The Buzzer Swarm support power comes in clutch for Master Leaf once again. And the Engineer on the move. All of these tricky double play attempts. Master Leaf always trying to play around the outside in a way that you would not ex expect. And just in the nick of time, it looks like this Eradicator will emerge. Master Leaf with 10 grand in the bank. Even even more now as he has a huge bank and his unit production is just falling behind a little bit. Blink away of that Eradicator escapes from the Temporal Wormhole and or the Temporal Portal as it will slow down all of those units. Prodigy might be able to blink across the ridge. For now, he will just sit pretty there in the natural expansion. And once again, Master Leaf capturing the Tib Spike of Futurama. Futurama has been spending all of his cash pretty much from the beginning. And Master Leaf doing much of the same, keeping his income low also. Gunwalkers keeping their keeping active, keeping busy. They're going to the gym. They're hitting those harvesters, making sure that they're always paying attention to what's going on in their opponent's Tiberium field, apparently. Corruptors out on the field. Lightning Spike is here. And the Eradicator Hexapod does move forward. Blink back by the Prodigy. Blink forward by the Prodigy. Rather, EMP comes in, and Master Leaf will find the EMP. He's going to lock down that Eradicator with a double touch there as the Area Mind Control takes that. Oh, the Prodigy survives barely. The Area Mind Control takes that. 
tripod and turns it around, but now the Prodigy comes back to the forefront and Masterly barely escaping with his Prodigy, but there's the Buzzer Swarm support power coming in clutch this time for Futurama as the phase comes in to save that Eradicator Hexapod and Masterly forced to sell off his own Warp Chasm will have the problems of, to, of yesterday come back to today. He looked like he was set up, but he's not even going to fight it out. The GG comes through and Masterly gives up one of the last games that he has to lose. Futurama never stopping the EMP from that tripod, almost turned things around for Masterly, but he never got far enough ahead and that will do it as Futurama takes another win. And game six will bring us back to Atacama Road for another mirror matchup, but this time it is going to be a GDI mirror matchup in the north playing the yellow. This is Masterleaf. And guess who's on the south side? I bet you'll never figure it out. As the Cyan, this is Futurama. Futurama playing a best of 13, dropping one game so far. He has found himself with some somewhat lucky wins, like that game on Airport Escape where Master Leaf wasn't paying attention or didn't see those descents or whatever. He has found himself with some tight back and forths. And then he's also just sort of found himself at one end of a steamroller as Master Leaf lays down and dies like in that last game on Decision. Atacama Road is going to be a fast airfield for Master Leaf. Not something you expect very often. Uh, okay. Whew. There's a watchtower here. That was almost... Ter okay. Does Futurama see this? How much does Futurama see? He sees the airfield. He actually has vision on the airfield, and now the rifleman comes in. He sees everything. Futurama knows exactly what Master Leaf is doing. He sees that it is a desperate play late in the series. At the edge of death, Master Leaf decides to go all in on a double airfield with a double engineer, and he is going to make this work. I don't know that I've ever seen this build work in a tournament game. Maybe once trying to think was there a tournament underground game where this actually did work but most of the time this build does fail most of the time that i see it this build doesn't work orca uh box transport does fly over engineer might be going down here orca's cleaning up the pit bulls one by one and i guess if they can clear out the pit bulls then they can clear out the harvesters after that last rocket slams in ox transport goes down three out of the four tib spikes is still pretty good for master leaf he's got one harvester he's got one refinery and his bank is not going to be growing very much from where it is right now futurama on the other hand needs to survive orca strike going to be coming in he could maybe even try and move his MCV a little bit closer. He is going to be getting a sneaky engineer on the right side to make sure that he doesn't lose control of that tip spike for very much longer. Pitbull's moving out to meet the Orcas in the field of battle. The perfect scouting pattern from Futurama. He saw this coming from as far away as he could. He literally saw the first moment that he possibly could, the airfield, and then he confirmed the double airfield. Master Leaf losing Orca after Orca will lose game number six. Three minutes and 30 seconds, slightly less than for Master Leaf as he taps out of that game and sends us into match point of this best of 13 of the Winter Championship Grand Final. And Winter Meltdown will be that battlefield for game number seven as Havoc is on Overwatch for our next mirror matchup. It is not what I expected these players to choose, but it will be a black hand ditto here on Winter Meltdown in the North, playing as the yellow GDI. Give it up for Master Leaf!
And in the South Plain, the Cyan also playing Black Hand. He is on the cusp of victory. He just needs to not mess up and throw it all away now. Give a cheer for Futurama! Futurama has played incredibly well all tournament long. The group stages landing him into the upper bracket with everyone else in the playoffs, but he alone has remained in the upper bracket, knocking down all opponents. Everyone who shows up to take a piece of him, he knocks them down and keeps on rolling. And now he's on the verge of doing it again. Masterleaf says it's time to bring back the flames that will rise, the greatest conflagration that Kane's Wrath has ever seen. It's gonna be what? A rocket reckoner? This is not what he will expect. I. Master Leaf might be hoping, well, Futurama is going for his own flame rush. Futurama is going for his own flame tank right through the middle of the map, and Master Leaf is going to find it. He is going to see it with the bike. They both get reads on each other very early on, and Master Leaf is going to get the kill on the flame tank, unless he really messes this up. But his control is alive. Master Leaf can't make any more mistakes, and no, the Reckoner gets tagged way too far away from the Harvesters. This Reckoner is supposed to be knocking down Harvesters, but instead, it'll knock down this Flame Tank. The Reckoner will survive, the Flame Tank will go down, and they have both spent their basically entire starting bank and have gotten almost nothing for it. It is not a full reset from both players, but we almost can just call this game starting right now. Master Leaf got out his second Harvester faster than Futurama. He is in the better situation, but I don't know. That Reckoner Rocket Rush, if it had landed a little bit closer to these Harvesters, they don't have stealth to be able to hide away from those rockets. Master Leaf comes in, he gets the kill, but he doesn't get the second kill on the bike, so he keeps his hope alive as Futurama bounces back in that engagement. Futurama should not have won that bike fight that quickly, but he did, and Master Leaf doesn't have a Shredder turret queued. Master Leaf is about to experience disaster. He places down a fresh power plant right as that one lose dies, and he will be able to get up the Shredder turret in time to save the next power plant. He's got it queued, drops the additional power plant, deploys the Shredder turret, and will be able to start gunning down this Black Hand. Power plant body block to try and save the first one, but as the bikes come in, Master Leaf has now overspit. He's got a little bit of cash in the bank. Where are the bikes? Where is the production of Master Leaf? He's gonna go for a hand of knot. He's gonna go for rockets. The juking is good. It's almost perfect, but it's not good enough. No, it is. Oh my gosh, Master Leaf's Harvester just won't die. The last rocket finds it, and Futurama's bike explodes moments later. I cannot believe Master Leaf saved that Harvester for so long. That Harvester was right on the edge of death for most of its life. The double refinery pays the price as Master Leaf tries to get out his bigger economy sooner and doesn't have the defense to hold off the bikes. Futurama can give up a game I can give up a couple of games, to be honest. Uh, letting your MCV get tagged by that is not how you want to give up the game. But he can give up the, a couple of games and still be in a comfortable position score-wise. But as soon as Master Leaf gets the momentum, he might be able to pull out a couple more of those trick plays that we have seen him execute so often in this tournament and start his own snowball rolling. Scorpions, 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 the name of the game. Isn't there supposed to be an MCV somewhere on this map? 
There is, in theory, supposed to be an MCV for both players, but the fake out, this is already turning into a trick play here in game number seven with his tournament life on the line. Masterleaf says, I'd rather get the cash boost and fight this one out with scorpions and with rockets than let you play the long game. Laser turrets do come out. The, tr the hub going to be hiding behind that MCV, and Futurama is hoping to spread out this game and delay the death of his MCV as long as he can. He might be able to sneak an engineer into it to get a heal if he drops a hand of Nod nice and close, but it looks like the Scorpions of Masterly are going to knock down that Conyard, and suddenly Masterleaf is in the driver's seat of this game. He has to do this like five more times to be able to win this series, but it starts with this first step. The Conyard survives. The Scorpion tanks stop attacking it. They're just going to try and roll into the main base. He's hoping to kill the Harvesters. He's hoping to shut down these rocket squads. But so many of the Scorpions have already gone down, and Masterleaf behind this needs this to work. Futurama with bikes or something edging up the right side of the map. He's going to be able to find an exposed base of Masterleaf. Bikes going to be rolling into the base of Masterleaf, finding Harvesters unattended and exposed as the Scorpions go down. Masterleaf never killed that MCB. It's back up to almost half half health and the bikes are now ravaging his harvesters back in the main one harvester goes down the scorpions looking to clear out the rest of the bikes futurama has bought for himself so much time and master leaf now has to restart the assault on the mcv but he backs off giving futurama even more time the indecision is wrecking master leaf's army in this game i'll go here and i'll go there i'll pass this way and that way and the result is scorpion tanks health bars depleting one by one down to red down to yellow not with a kill on the mcv not with a kill on the harvesters they're just roaming the map hoping to find a win and now getting separated out by the terrain of winter meltdown master leaf is letting every advantage that he had slip away the gg gets called and master leaf will drop out of the winter championship your champion is futurama GG gets called and Futurama with dropping only a single map in the grand final mirror non mirrors he played it all and he comes out ahead in a best of 13 knocking down green zero knocking down shock trepid and master leaf twice uh, all opposition has been defeated by Futurama as he rises to claim the championship of winter. As he rises to claim the winter championship for 2022 of Kane's Rat. Thank you all very much for watching. Big shout outs to Rodder Milan and Bike Rush for running this tournament. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And this is Cybert signing out.